tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape. Transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are lost in the trackless wild of the Irish moors. Your only companion, a beautiful gypsy woman. And you know that somewhere in the dark behind you, searching every foot of ground for you, is the giant of a man called Charon, who plans to take your girl, and at the same time, take your life. Listen now as Escape brings you John Daner's story, Ben Chalina and the Fisherman. It was a cold and gusty night that found me sitting over a whiskey in a pub in Ballymoran, a lonely village situated on the bleak uplands of County Mayo in the west of Ireland. I had come over from London for a fortnight of trout fishing, which I'd been told was excellent in these parts. As it was late and the pub deserted, I was questioning the proprietor, one Hackett J. O'Cool, about the lakes and streams nearby. He was a little man, All mustache and eyebrows and a bowler hat pulled down over his ears, industriously polishing the glasses behind the counter. And through life unblessed we hear So, you're here for the fishing now? Yes, I've been told it's excellent here. Oh, that it is, that it is. Losing all that me life, dear. Well, where would you suggest I make a start? It's well now. That's hard to say, hard to say. You, you might try the reels of Kildenny. The reels of... No, 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 no. Think it over twice. You'd be better off in the loch. Well, where's that? Yes, yes, yes. That'll be the best, I'm sure, for a stranger. The loch. Where is the loch? The loch, the Nile, is only a mile to the east. Yeah, but that's by going straight up. To get there, you have to walk around the mountain five miles and... Oh, there's no road and the... No, 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 no. That, that, that's too far. You better try something closer in. <laughs> So far, I have the Rills of Kildenny and Loch Donal. They're both good, you say. Oh, good trout that long. That long? Well, that long. Even that's respectable. Respectable? I'll tell you whether trout are more respectable than that. I'd better have another whiskey. Aye, and you'll need it when I tell you about the place I'm dreaming. Won't you join me, Mr. O'Cool? Oh, <laughs> Mr., I will. <laughs> oh, I should not even be telling you this, but... Uh, uh, but I feel it my duty since you've come all the way from London with your fish pole. Yes, I'd hate to be disappointed. The Drino. The Drino? Where's that? The waters of the Drino up on Dark Mayo. And the fishing's good? Yeah, that big. Truly? Strike me, a firm line, strike me dead. But why did you hesitate a moment ago? It's because... Well, Dark Mayo... What is Dark Mayo? Oh, the loneliest moor in all of Ireland, north or south, stretches from the mountains to the sea and cursed with a loneliness that keeps all living things away. Where do I find this place? Yeah, all except for the gypsy folk. Last year, before he went mad, Pothery Slogan told of seeing the black Romany dancing among the spirits. People in the vapors with a wild fandango they were. Mr. O'Cool, how far is it? With burning and flames. How far, Mr. O'Cool? Not far. Not far, but you'd be lost forever. Oh, come now. I'm sure the wee folk won't make off with a harmless fisherman like me. How do I find this, uh, this dark mayo and the drino? When through life unblessed we rove... I'll tell you. The following day, I gave myself an early start and arrived after an hour's walk at the place described by Mr. O'Cool. 
dark Mayo and the waters of the Drino. It was a cheerless expanse of ancient rock and wild gorse shrouded over with lifeless tatters of mist or, or vapors. I could readily understand the natives' reluctance to set foot on this bleak ground. But the deep flowing waters of the Drino excited me in this barren land, and soon I had my line in the water. Mr. O'Cool was right. The trout were magnificent, and my luck was with me. It was almost noon when something really big struck at my fly. Blast! Missed you. Well, I'll get you yet. <laughs> Who's there? Be careful you do not fall off the rock. I can't see you. Here? Here I am. Oh, oh I see you now. I... Oh. What is the matter? But Nothing. It's... So lonely here, so desolate, I didn't expect to see anyone, let alone a beautiful young woman. Oh, no, no. It is you who is beautiful. I watch you all morning. You've been here all morning? By the rocks up there. And I say, oh, what a beautiful man. I wonder what he's like to love him. Oh? Uh, well, is that so? I see you lose that fish. You're very funny. The look on your face when you say, blood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I enjoy that word. Uh, seems to help me carry the burden of my misfortune. Blood! Blood! <laughs> <laughs> I say, you'll frighten off all the fish. They can hear you, know. Oh, that is lies. But I tell you, I am magic. All morning I make you catch fish. All the fish, all morning. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Now, again you go fish, and I say, you catch the same one you just lose. I hope you're right. Well, here goes. Cross your fingers or whatever it is you've been doing. Now, into that pool over there. Perfect. Now we'll see. Yes, you will catch him very soon. Working your magic? Yes, magic, 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 magic. Good. You know, you worry me. Why? Aren't you uh, cold, dressed like that? I am not cold. Hardly fitting for the rigors of dark mail. Don't you like? Fascinating. Inadequate, but... There he is again. Got him. You see, the magic one. He's a fighter. I'll have to work closer to him. Oh, be careful that rock you step on. Now, boy, I've got you now. I've got you. He's slipping. The rock. Oh, I help. I help. I'm all right. I can just... Ooh. Oh, what is the matter? Nothing. I'll be all... Oh. oh, let me help you. I must have twisted my ankle. I can't put any weight on it. Here, take my hand. Oh, you'll get all wet. No. Hold now. So, up, slowly. <laughs> there now. Thank you. Poor, beautiful man. Let me look at your leg. Can't see nothing. It hurt. Can't put my weight on it. You come with me to my caravan. I fix you. Uh, why not back to Ballymoran? It is too far. My caravan is closer. Come, I show you. The camp of the gypsies lay in a sheltered pocket of ground surrounded by great boulders and the never ending scrub of dark mail. There was none of the color which I associated with a gypsy camp and the people of Romany. Instead, here were a grim folk, animating a dismal landscape, who fell silent at my approach and who looked at me with suspicion. There was a cook fire burning in the center of the clearing, an old crone stirring a black kettle. The beautiful gypsy girl helped me into her caravan, a rather disorderly house on wheels. It made me comfortable on a pile of blankets. <sighs> Now, I will make you well. First time I've been in one of these. 
It is my home. It's rather clever at that. Like the tortoise, you carry your house with you. Yes, like a tortoise. Everything on my back, heavy. Uh. I noticed the others, too. So grim. No smiles. It is Choron, the head of my tribe. A hard man? Hard. Cruel. But he is gone away now to trade horses in the south country. He will not be back for a long time. Oh, but let us not talk about him. Here, you lie back, and I will fix you. What is that? Magic. <laughs> Hold on there. The last time you tried your magic, it broke my leg. Oh, no, no. My magic only catch you fish. Anyway, your leg not broken. Oh, I see. This is blood of my brother. Blood of you? In that bag? Oh, not real blood. Little stone, little glass, and many flowers. I put it on your leg. So? And it will take away the pain. Very magic. An amulet, eh? Look, don't you think I should get to a doctor? <sighs> Why did you do that? You are beautiful. I like to kiss you. Yes. It does seem to help. You like to? I think we should try it again. Just to be sure. <laughs> what is your name? Benchilina is her name. <gasps> Candana Mingro! Benchilina Petulengro, her name. So stute carrying a kai, Jugal. The woman who is to marry Churon. You spy for Churon? Yes, for Churon. What the devil is this all about? Ah, he's Vino, the shadow of Churon. He is the coward who whispers the ugly stories to his master. Now, look here. Oh, God, you. You rest. This is not you, fight. You rest. You, Carlo. What are you doing here tonight? Joron is coming, Benchilina, you know. I will not be here. He will find you. Then I will be dead. I will not marry him. So, I shall sit here... And wait until he comes. Do your waiting outside, Carlo. No. Joron says I watch. I watch. It will be a long watch. Not long. Joron comes in the morning. He... In the morning? He, he is coming to take his bride, the beautiful Benchilina. You lie. He is in the south. But what will Choron say in the morning when I tell him the beautiful Benchilina was kiss the gorgio here? You will not tell Choron anything. He will cut you in the face in the morning if I tell him is not so. You will not tell Choron anything. Benchilina. In the morning, Benchilina. Not anything! Hey, oh. Vino? Vino? Wait. <clears throat> Let me look at him. Huh? What? Hmm. Gave him a good one, all right. Is he dead? No. No, but what happens now? We must go. You and me. Why? Because of this Charon? If he find us here, he kill you and he kill me. Now is the time to run. To hide. Come. You are listening to Ben Chilina and the Fisherman. Tonight's presentation of Escape. In the world of narcotics, a pusher is someone who sells the illegal drugs. Tomorrow evening, CBS Radio's Night Watch Police tape record an actual attempt to make a sale. An attempt intercepted by alert night watchers. Every Friday evening, CBS Radio spotlights true dramatic police proceedings on Night Watch. And now, Escape and the second act of Benjolina and the Fisherman.
albino lay unconscious on the floor of the caravan. There was a sickly pallor to his face, and as I looked at his still form, a wild thought came to me. What if he's dead? Not unconscious, but dead. And the name Charon took shape in my mind as something to fear. That maybe the coming morning would bring me to disaster. Suddenly, I found myself drawn into the conflict as surely as though it were myself had struck Vino. From now on, I knew my fortunes were with the gypsy Benchalina. And so we fled the gypsy camp. All night, Benchalina drove the horse cart at high speed over the moor, over the endless miles of dark mayo, until at dawn the road dwindled to little more than a cow path, and we came to the sea. There was a stone cottage standing alone on a cliff, but something was wrong. Oh, no, no, not here, not here. What's the matter? I came all the way west, but I take the wrong road. I am lost. Ah, get up! Ah! What are you doing? I must find the road. But you're going back. I must find the road. It's suicide. We can't go back. Charon is following. Give me the reins. No, no. Give them to me. No, I give them. Not to give. No. Who? Who? Now be sensible. If we go back one step, we'll walk right into Choron. He can't be far behind. We'll find some other way. We'll go back to that cottage and ask. Yep. There is a town, Belclou. Where is Belclou? It is in a bay by the ocean. If we find Belclou, we are safe. Who? We'll ask here. Help me down. Yes. Now, give me your hand. <clears throat> your foot is better? Mm. Seems to be. Now, let's see if there's anyone about. Hello? Anyone here? Hello? Let's look inside. Deserted. Come, Don't let's... go in. Why not? There is death in the house. Death? Come now, it's just an ordinary cottage. It... Death has been here. For death is waiting. I know. In my bones, I know. Well, if it will make you feel better, we don't have to go in. Don't go in. Then let's look around. Come along. Let's see what we can from the point. Yes. There you are. The ocean. It makes me afraid. The waves, the water. We so high. You're afraid of many things. The Romani are afraid of the great oceans. Good. Maybe that will keep Choron away. Ah, uh, not Choron. He will follow anywhere we go except... Wait. Look. What? Over there. The bay. Where? No, no, no. Farther along the coast. See? The town. Oh, yes. Belclou. I know it is. The town you were looking for? Yes. I... But see, there is no road along the cliffs. No way to reach it from here without going back. We can't do that. Wait, wait a minute. I have an idea. I'll go down to the water. Maybe there's a boat that belongs to this cottage. If I find one, we can make our way around the point and cross the bay to Belclou. You stay here and keep watch. I'll be right back. By the water's edge, I found what I was looking for. A battered but serviceable dory in a sheltered cove. I was elated, and I hastened back up the path to tell Benchalina the good news. When I reached the top, I called to her. There was no answer. I looked out across the moor, but Benchalina was nowhere in sight. 
I became alarmed and increased my pace, calling to her again and again. Still, there was no answer. Then, rounding the cottage, I saw something that stopped me dead in my tracks. There in the sun, sitting on the stone wall, swinging his legs back and forth, was a man. A swarthy man with a handsome, pockmarked face. He was whistling a tune. When he saw me, he stopped and smiled. Sir, good day. Then he beckoned to me with the gun he held in his right hand. Please, come here. Oh, I am so sorry. Your leg, yes, they told me you injured it. What a shame. You must be... Joram. Joram de Kangalar. I believe you have heard of me. I've heard of you. Far enough, stop there. Now let me look at you. I... I know it's right. You are handsome. Quite understandable that Benchelina should be carried away. Where is Benchelina? Out there. Hiding behind that big rock. I don't see her. <laughs> no, we don't see her. But I know she is there. She saw me coming, ran to hide. Now she's watching to see what I will do. And what are you going to do? You will see. Then, Shalina, listen to me. It is time to go. I will count to ten. If you do not come before I finish, I will shoot your lover. Shoot? What kind of man are you? <laughs> One, two, three, four. This is insane. Two, five, six, seven. Seven, Benchelina, think. Your lover. Seven. Eight. <laughs> ah, there she is. Good. Very good. Very wise, Benchelina. Hurry now, it's time to go back. Hello, Romani chief. Uh, you are still beautiful. Kanda na mingro. Too bad you are still beautiful. Look, I don't know what you're planning to do. Gorgio, but... don't say anything. It is all right. I will go back. Now, lover, we do not need you. Turn around. What do you do, Choron? We leave the Barasan here. Around, I say. Oh, no, Choron, no! No! <laughs> must have been a savage blow, for I lay unconscious most of the day. When I opened my eyes, the clouds had blanked out the sun, and the sky was threatening. I dragged myself into the cottage. It was empty. In one corner, there was a pile of dried seaweed, and I fell across it. For a long while, I lay unmoving. Then came the wind, then the rain. I managed to find fuel to light a fire in the hearth. At least I would be warm. Night came. It was sometime during the early hours when looking toward the door, I saw it swing slowly open. I rubbed my eyes and looked again. Framed in the doorway was a man. I looked closely, then I recognized that it was Charon. He was standing in the heavy downpour, his right hand behind his back. I bring you a bride. I... I don't understand you. I bring back your love. What have you done with Benchelina? She is with me. You want to see? Of course I want to see Benchelina. All right. Then look! Benchelina, come. Benchelina! It was unbelievable. 
But only that morning had been a wild and beautiful creature. Stood before me now, a hag, with incredible brutality. Charon had carved a thousand deep wrinkles into her face and broken her teeth into ugly snags. Her hair hung lank over her face. Only the eyes showed it was Ben Selina. She stared at me, and a thousand raindrops, like a thousand tears, poured down her mutilated face. You like her? Your bride? What have you done to Ben Selina? She is yours. Barasar. You foul, insane. What have you done? Do not come closer. I'll kill you, you evil coward, you rat. Are you? No. He will shoot you. I'll kill him. One more step and I shoot. No, Joron. No. Stop. Get on them. Ah. Ah. Give me that gun. Sharon was dead at my feet. Benchelina's body lay a little to the side. Her black hair covering her tortured face. I looked at her for a long while. Then I went outside. Dark Mayo was suffering under the heavy rain. I walked down the path to the road. And then down the road. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you transcribed Ben Chalina and the Fisherman by John Daner, starring Vic Perrin with Paula Winslow. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear, John Daner, and Lawrence Dobkin. Your announcer, Roy Rowan. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are drifting along the muddy reaches of a South American river... Your diving gear in readiness, the air pump going. Yet you know that in the murky depths below you, waiting in the slime there for you, is a mortal enemy from whom there may be no escape. So listen next week when Escape brings you Anthony Barrett's story, Blood Waters. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you the great news reporters of the CBS Radio Newsroom, Edward R. Murrow, Lowell Thomas, Robert Trout, and a long list of familiar names for news. And remember, every weeknight, CBS Radio broadcasts a complete up-to-the-minute summary of the Army McCarthy hearings. Throughout the hearings, tune in CBS Radio for complete evening coverage of each day's significant events. Listen for Robert Trout reporting on the news on the CBS Radio Network. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today... for a half hour of high adventure. You are 
are drifting along the muddy reaches of a South American river. Your diving gear in readiness. The air pump going. Yet you know that in the murky depths below you, waiting in the slime there for you, is a mortal enemy from whom there may be no escape. Listen now as Escape brings you Tony Barrett's story, Bloodwaters. They take you up slowly, always slowly, even in a nothing job like this one. A harbor bottom dive that a beginner would laugh at. I kicked away from the heavy pilings harder than I had to. And I knew I was trying to dull my mind again not to think about it. Trying to sell myself the same old story. That a diver shouldn't care where he works because the job's always the same. There's something down there. They want it. You get it, period. But it didn't work too well. The story was wearing thin. There you are, Sino. You want the suit off or you want to rest first, huh? Rest from what? A 50-foot dive? Get me out of the suit. See, si, see. Si. Perhaps the man knows best, Trent. Murdoch. A 50-foot dive can be dangerous. But then danger never bothered you, did it? What are you doing here, Murdoch? What do you want? Does an old friend have to want something? I'm not interested in any of your deals. Really? With this job finished and nothing else in sight? I'm busy, Murdoch. Beat it. No curiosity, Trent? Not so much as a... What are you doing in a forsaken hole in Argentina? <laughs> you never were much at small talk, were you? Goodbye, Murdoch. Wait a minute. Take your hand off me. Why the rush? Uh, where are you going? You know it all. You tell me. Uh, all right. I will. What you do between now and tonight does not matter. But at nine o'clock, I shall expect you at the Café del Rondo. Promptly. And if I don't come... Can you afford not to come, Trent? It still takes money to live, even down here. I'll see you at nine o'clock. Uh, You've been talking for an hour now, Murdoch, and you haven't said anything. Get to it. You have no social graces. Pity. Uh, Trent, how would you like never to have to get into diving gear again? To be rich, really rich. To have everything you ever wanted. I had everything I wanted once. You remember that, don't you, Murdoch? Uh, How long have you been away from the States, Trent? What's that got to do with it? How long? Three years. Three stinking years. And don't you want to go back? No. I like work in jungle holes like this. I like 50-foot dockside dives with native boys that fall asleep on the pumps while you're down there. What are you building? A fortune for both of us. What do you want this time? My right eye? Can't you forget what happened? Can you? You're being stupid. You're out of your territory down here, Murdoch, so talk nice to me. Look, Trent... In two months, we can both walk out of here with more money than you ever dreamed of. I don't dream anymore. Gold, Trent. If I told you how much, you would think me mad. And you want to give me half? You will learn it. By diving? Yes. (laughs) Did I say something humorous? So you fell for the national industry. Don't you know there's a peddler on every corner down here selling maps of sunken treasure? (laughs) I love that. The smooth Vincent Murdoch is a tourist. (laughs) And now do you want to hear what I have to say? Say your piece. Did you ever hear of the Gran Chaco's Rebellion? 
Sorry I'm late, Senor. Ah, Maria, my dear. Uh, 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 may I present Senor Trent Paul? This is Maria Sandoval. Senorita? Senor? Uh, sit down, Maria. Uh, 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 something to drink? No, gracias. You said something about a rebellion. Fourteen years ago, to be exact. Bolivia and Paraguay were at either, each other's throats. It's in the history books. I didn't know you were a reader, Murdoch. The Paraguayans were getting the worst of it. So they loaded a small boat, the Santa Rosa, with millions in gold for shipping up the Paraguay River. It was to go to Brazil for safekeeping. Well? After the boat left Puerto Pinasco, it was never seen again. Nor was the gold. It's true, senor. Storm? They never even found survivors. Besides, uh, where would they look? <laughs> Have you any idea of the length of the Paraguay River? Two governments can't find the gold, but you can. That is correct. I can. What do you got? Charts? Better than that. What then? I said before that they never found survivors. I did. The only one. Interested, Trent? I don't want any part of you, Murdoch. Now or any time, so get off my back. Don't you realize what I'm offering you? I understand this. It's over. I'm through with you and your schemes, and I'm not running anymore. Get that through your head, you fat slut. Now, you listen to me. Three years ago, I listened to you. Three years down in this sinkhole is what I got for it. Three years, you foul, filthy pig. <laughs> I don't know how long it lasted. How many times I hit him trying to pay him back for the lonely years. But finally it was over. Finished. And I was back at the waterfront again. Tasting the soft breeze coming in from the sea. Senor? Senor Trent. What do you want? Oh. Maria, isn't it? Si. Maria. I'm sorry if I messed up your friend Murdoch. He's all right now. Besides, I have seen men fight before. Yeah, I'm sure you have. You always follow the winner? <laughs> Anger forces words the tongue does not want to say. My name is Trent, not Murdoch, plain enough. I know your name, Senor. Oh, there is a scratch on your cheek, Senor. A little blood. Let me... A woman knows how. Senor. Senor. Is that the way you kiss Murdoch? Your eyes, Paulito. The younger is still there. And it shouldn't be. Not after that, huh? Paulito. Who are you really kissing, Maria? Me or him? What do you want? The gold, Murdoch? Everybody wants something. What's yours? I want you to come with me, senor. No more Paulito, huh? Please. Come with me, please. i show you what I want. She turned and moved away without ever once looking back. As though she was sure I'd follow her. And she was right. The shack she led me to was less than a half mile away. No different than any of the others around it. She turned to look at me once as she opened the door. And her eyes were a thousand years old. She lit a lamp. And I looked where she was pointing. He lay on a bed in the corner, a little Portuguese, maybe 50, cackling softly to himself as though he knew a joke that nobody else would ever know. His hair was pure white, the kind that comes from too much terror, too much shock. And then I saw his hands. From fingertips to elbows, they were a mass of little scars, ugly, needle-like scars that spoke of some past moment of horror. We moved closer, but he never looked up. 
just sat crooning softly to a bottle of whiskey cradled in his arm. Maria? Who, who is he? Have you never seen a man who has lost his mind to fear? Look well, for he is such a one. Have you seen enough, senor? Is he a... a... My father. What is left of him? How did it happen, Maria? You have already been told. What? Murdoch spoke truth tonight when he told of a survivor from the Santa Rosa. There he is. Later, as we sat staring out at the water, she told me all of it. And it wasn't hard to follow. An old man, driven insane by terror, who clung to Murdoch because Murdoch kept him in whiskey, the one thing that pushed the terror away for a while. Very neat and tidy, the Murdoch touch. You understand now, Paulito? Yeah. What do you want me to do, Maria? Make the trip with Murdoch as his diver? Is that what you want? My father is a child now. Murdoch will use him and... Then... That's all you wanted from the beginning, isn't it? For me to be a watchdog. He is my father, Paulito. Yeah. I never asked. You going along? Si, I go. All right, Maria. I'll dive for Murdoch. Oh, gracias. Muchísimas gracias. It's all right. Paulito, kiss me, please. Gratitude for your father? No, not this time, querido. This time for me. Murdoch was all sweetness and light next morning when I told him he had a diver. You'd have sworn we were old buddies. He balked at only one thing, my wanting to take along Jose, the kid who'd handled pumps for me on the harbor job. But I wasn't about to do any diving without somebody I trusted handling lines. Murdoch didn't like it, but he couldn't afford to argue. Jose turned out to be a real good investment before we ever got started. That night, as a matter of fact. Senor. Oh, you finish up, Jose? Si, si. All finished, you know. You watch him crate the gear? I did it myself. <laughs> I should have known. Thanks. Senor, how well you know the Senor Murdoch? Too well. Why? Well, come on, Jose. What is it? While I was taking care of the gear, he was getting the permissos. The, how you, how you the say? The permits. Government permits for the interior? Si, si. You... Supposed to name all the people that go. I know that. What about it? I saw the papers, senor. Well? It's every name there except yours. I see. But why? Why does he do a thing like that, senor? What reason? To save explaining later. Okay. Murdoch's got it all figured out, Jose. No, I still do not understand. Why are you not on that list? It's real simple. A man who doesn't make a trip can't be expected to come back from it. You are listening to Bloodwaters, tonight's presentation of Escape. Millions in Asia living on inadequate diets and additional millions in free Europe fighting for post-war recovery, are the beneficiaries when you give to CARE, C-A-R-E. Send a $10 CARE package or the six ninety five dollars budget package. For further details, write CARE, New York. That's CARE, New York. And now, Escape and the second act of Bloodwaters. It's a 
thing you gotta see to believe. A thing that exists every foot of the length of Argentina. Get a couple of hours inland from the coast and you've gone back a thousand years. Nothing but jungle. Jungle so thick and green, you can travel a full day without ever once getting a glimpse of sunlight. It's bad enough anyway you try it, but doing it Murdoch's way was the worst. Murdoch, a gold-hungry, penny-pinching man who hadn't hired enough bearers, who skimped on food, and who hated every minute wasted on rest. Maria took it well, quiet for the most part, her eyes never far from Sandoval. The old man was pathetic, shambling along, falling off and uncaring and never hearing. There was only one sound that mattered in his world, the cork coming out of the bottle. And Murdoch was master of the bottle. Four days of it, four stinking, crawling days. And on the morning of the fifth, we came out of it. Stood there, looking out at the Paraguay River. The gold was showing in Murdoch's eyes again. Look at it, Trent. Beautiful, isn't it? It's a river. That's all it is. It's been a long walk. Where to now? Three days upriver. Do you have any objections? You're footing the bill. And you should remember that. To check our supplies while I make arrangements for the boat. Don't you want me to take a look at the boat before you make a deal? Make sure you get a good winch? You have a short memory, Trent. I'd say I'm fairly capable of making deals, wouldn't you? <laughs> you just make sure the bearers don't steal anything when they leave. I take care of that for you, Seno. Well, thanks, Jose. Oh, and keep an eye on the old man, eh? Si, Seno. Ole, hombre. Ven aquí. Paulito. Oh, Maria. You all right? I see. Oh, I... I'm so grateful to you, querido. For what? For everything. Everything. Paulito, you take care with Murdoch. He's a dangerous man. Yeah, yeah. Now listen to me. From here on, it's going to be different. Different? We'll all be on a small boat for days, maybe weeks. I won't always be around because of the diving. Here. What? Take the gun. What? Just take it and hope you don't have to use it. A couple of hours later, Murdoch came back and waved us down to the river. Instead of being alone, now he had a native with him. A big man he called Batu. A lot of man. Even through the paint on his face, you could see the combination of Mayan and Inca. The thousand-year-old dignity as he stood looking at us. Trent, this is Batu. I've just arranged for the boat and he's going up river with us. To help with the loading, Batu. Batu, help. What are we taking him for, Murdoch? He wants to go up river to his people and he will work for his passage. We can use him. You keep adding people. Somebody's going to have to swim alongside. That ain't much of a boat. Now, now, Trent. This is no time to be at each other's throats. I know we are on the right track. Sandoval started getting excited the moment he saw this part of the river. For a guy in his condition, you're doing a lot of depending on him. Uh, you let me worry about that. All you have to do is handle your end of things, and that won't begin until we start diving. You're wrong, Murdoch. I started worrying three years ago, remember? Two days on the river. Two long days with Murdoch never once taking his eyes off Sandoval. Watching each slightest reaction, the bottle always ready. And the old man needed that bottle now, his terror growing by the minute, and Murdoch loving it because it told him we were getting closer. That night, I was laying out my gear back in the stern when Batu, the big native, came toward me. He wasn't the calm giant anymore, just a man, a terrified man with words tumbling out of his mouth. You tell Batu, you tell. Tell you what? About crazy man. Crazy? Sandoval? Well, what about him? Hands. The scars? You mean how did he get them? Yes. I don't know what happened to his hands, but what about him? Why you come here? To dive. To bring something up from the water. Why? No. Not go in water. No. Why not? What's wrong? Not go. Devil water. Devil water. You not go in devil water. And that's all I could get out of him. Just that. 
was a long time before I got to sleep that night. Late on the third day, we dropped anchor just outside a small cove. Murdoch was out of his mind with excitement. But it was too dark for diving. We'd start in the morning. Batu wanted to go ashore to see his people. Swore he'd be back before sunup. Murdoch didn't like it, but he had no choice. We needed the big man on pumps. In the morning, we were up at dawn, and Batu was back aboard. He didn't say much. But he was never more than a couple of feet away from me. And his eyes never left me. But I didn't have time to think about it. I had my own troubles. What's taking you so long, Trent? Oh, you and your penny pension. You've been had, Murdoch. Well, what's wrong? Well, not a thing, except this winch is on its last leg. Oh, uh, well, let's not argue. Repair it the best you can. Talk's cheap, but I'm the guy who goes down there. Listen to me, Trent. We're close, really close. Sandoval swears it's right beneath us. He has to be right. He's pointed out landmarks all the way. Wait a minute. What's that? It's native drums, you know. Probably a welcome. Uh, get that shoot closed, Trent. We're losing time. Uh... You remember what I say about clear lines down there, Senor, huh? I'll remember. And don't you forget. Look, Senor. Look on the shore. Natives, six or seven of them. He's part of Batu's tribe. Uh, what's that they're carrying? Well, it looks like a pig or a goat. And the throat is cut. What is it, Batu? What are they doing? Make sacrifice to river god. But why now? Save you. From what? What's down there? A native superstition, Trent. Where's your intelligence? Are you ready? Batu. You not stay in water long. Kataya! On the beach, they heard his command, and the pig was thrown into the river. A moment later, Jose had bolted my helmet in place, and I was being lowered over the side of the boat. Everything was forgotten now. But the work is staying alive. That's how it is with diving. You can do it a thousand times, but it's always new. Jose knew it. Through the phone, I could hear him worrying with me. You all right, Seno? Yeah. Read me. See? Eleven fathoms. Stay with me. I'm going to have a little rock around. I checked my lines and started toward a large mass of shadow. Distances underwater fool you. I was on it almost before I started. It was a ship, or what was left of one. Her back had been broken in two, and her stern was right in front of me. I read it aloud. Santa Rosa. What's that, Seno? I found it. Start a line down. He's found it. You're here. He's found it. I went in carefully, slowly, making sure of my lines. It didn't take me 20 minutes to find it. A tremendous iron-bound chest. I scratched the slime off with my knife, and there it was. The official seal of Paraguay. There wasn't any doubt now what was inside. I got a line around it told them which way to swing the winch and managed to get it out in the clear for the trip up. I just about finished when I felt a signal on my lines. What is it? Batu says to get up here quick. You've been down too long. Why? Friends, this is Murdoch. Let's get the gold up first. Another moment won't hurt you. Let's not take chances on a fault line. Let's not take chances on me. Tell Jose to take me up. If he tries it, I shall shoot him. The goal comes up first. Stand clear, Trent. Murdoch, listen. My knife is across the line. You turn that winch and I'll cut the line. You hear me? You're insane. I could cut your air holes. Go on, cut it. I'm tired of living with you on my back anyway. Oh, all right, Trent, all right. Now, don't get excited. We're, we're taking you up. Slowly, they began taking me up. And then I realized why. Murdoch knew once I started up, I couldn't possibly cut the line that held the chest. He took me up just far enough to get my hands on the bottom rung of the Jacob's ladder and hang there helplessly. Then, through the phones, I could hear the creak of the winch as he started hauling up the chest. Looking up through the water, I could see Murdoch leaning over the rail as he waited for the chest to break water. 
And then it happened. A sudden sharp sting on my hand. And when I looked, I saw blood. Blood and a six-inch fish racing in for another bite. In a second, there were more of them. Little needle-toothed devils plunging at the canvas suit, even trying to bite through the steel of the helmet to get at the flesh inside. And at last, I understood everything. Why Batu called it devil water. Why Sandoval had gone insane. And what happened to the crew of the Santa Rosa. That six-inch fish was the South American piranha, a cannibal so deadly it strips a man to the bone in 30 seconds. Then I heard something else. The winch. Murdoch had been driving it too fast, even for a good winch. It started to crumple just as the chest broke water. Murdoch saw the chest, inches from his hand, start slipping back. And the thought of losing the gold drove him crazy. He grabbed for it. Even as the chest pulled him down past me, he was still holding on to it. Even as the piranha left me to strip easier pickings than steel and canvas, he held on to it. And I knew he'd never let go. How could he? Hadn't the gold pulled him halfway around the world? And then climbed out of the water to get him? Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you Bloodwaters by Tony Barrett, starring Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Lillian Bayef, Tony Barrett, and Barney Phillips. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are one of four people trapped in an isolated trading post somewhere in the Yukon Territory. The blizzard outside making escape impossible. And you know that before the spring thaws release you, before you can leave this cabin behind you, one of your companions, by consent of the others, will be killed. So listen next week when Escape brings you Les Crutchfield's story, Judgment Day at Crippled Deer. Every weekday for 90 solid minutes, Arthur Godfrey Time presents that redhead himself coming up with one surprise after another. And every Friday night on most of these same CBS radio stations, we take the top surprises, the most songs, the biggest laughs out of the daytime shows, and glue them together into a big once-a-week treat. Tomorrow night, don't miss the Arthur Godfrey Digest at the Star's Address. Daytime is a gay time with Arthur Godfrey Time on the CBS Radio Network. of the everyday grind, ever dream of a life of romantic adventure, want to get away from it all, we offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are one of four people trapped in an isolated trading post somewhere in the Yukon Territory. The blizzard outside making escape impossible. And you know that before the spring thaws release you, before you can leave this cabin behind you, one of your companions, by consent of the others, will be killed. Listen now as escape brings you Les Crutchfield's story, Judgment Day at Crippled Deer.
I think it most unlikely that you ever heard of Crippled Deer Crossing. Now you would have great difficulty locating it on a map. Even though the Yukon, for the most part, is vast and empty. Crippled Deer is a trading post. One sprawling pine log building, nothing more. But it's been my home and my business for 20 years now. And in the course of time, I have grown fond of it. Even grown fond of the bitter cruelty of the great north. Yes, fond, too, of the long winters, snowbound, dark, when the trappers and miners have all gone outside, and we wait alone for the coming of spring. But of one such winter I am not fond. I still wake at times from dreaming of it, lie shuddering and fearful in the darkness. That was the winter of the black snow, when the horror came moaning on the wind and no man could look in another's eyes without shame and loathing and hate. Listen, LeClaire. Listen to it. I know that sound and the gray skies and the black in the west. It's going to hit us before tomorrow morning. Oh, it's close, all right. What do you think, Joe? Many wolf track in snow last night. Much hunting. Bear now asleep. I think maybe one day, maybe two, then big blizzard come. All right, mm. two days then. That's still cutting it too close. You ought to be here by now. <laughs> Real anxious, ain't you, Bella? Just can't wait. Honey, what smart cook got that we ain't got? You wouldn't know, Higgins. You would, though, wouldn't you, sweetheart? At least he's got a civil tongue in his head. And he's also got a lot of things you'd give your right arm for, Higgins. He knows how to laugh and live and how to make other people laugh and live. I'll bet he does. And he knows how to treat a woman. Yeah, any woman, the way I hear it. You shut that mouth of yours right now or I'll make you wish you had. You will. Well, uh, Higgins, in a day or two now, the blizzard comes. Close the trails. And we hear then all of us together the rest of the winter. Here, this one building, no way to get out. I'll tell you once and for all, I will not have this kind of feeling. Then let him shut up. Can't take a joke. That's man. enough, Higgins. He's got a right to be worried. I'm worried myself. Marco and Blakey don't have enough grub up there. If they get snowed into that mine, they can't possibly last out the winter. And that blizzard is close. Should have come down by now. I was just funning her, Leclerc. Sorry, Belle. Then watch what you're saying. Don't worry. They'll make it all right. Why, Marco Moore knows more about this country and the weather Why? than most people. No talk. He's down. Well, what is it, Joe? Dog team. Sled coming. Marco. Oh. Must be Marco and Blake. Where's those binoculars? Maybe we can see them when they come through the gap, huh? Hegan, help me open the window. Might not be them, Bell. Could be Robertson. Not him. He's too smart a money to get snowed in in this far from Dawson. Come on, push. Uh, yeah. All right, here. Let me see now. It's nearly too dark to... Hey, there's a sled, all right, coming out of the gap. It's them. It is them, isn't it? I can't quite make... No. No, it's only one man. A Marty. No. No, not Robertson. It... It's Blakey. But Marco is not with him. What? Blakey coming in alone. Alone? Two partner go. One come back very bad. No, no, no. Shut up, Joe. Don't pay any attention to him, Bell. Marco is all right. He better be. For Blakey's sake, he better be. You know, they've been partners three seasons now, Bell. There's no reason to think anything is wrong. You look dog team, lead dog. Marco's dog. What? He's right. He's that big husky with a white star. Marco got him two years ago. Turn up the man, Jim. Bring up the girl. Blakey's back. I don't know. I just don't know. Prodigal son, Jim. Star for a fatted calf and maybe a glass of two or rye whiskey. Blakey. <laughs> well, Leclerc, uglier than ever. Indian Joe, what are you having to tribe, huh? <laughs> Hey, oh, Higgins, look at that punch. And Bell, ah, oh, sweetheart, you make up for all of them. Gorgeous. Blakey, where's Marco? 
Marco? Well, ain't he here yet? Should he be? Well, he pulled out a few days before I did. I stayed on till yesterday working the claim. Of course, he, uh, <clears throat> he might have stopped off someplace. Where? Stopped off where? Well, maybe, uh, maybe at Jackson River. The factory at the post there's got a pair of mighty pretty daughters, Bell. <laughs> you better get your dogs out of harness, Blake, and get your stuff inside. It may start snowing. Yeah, looks like it's building up a good one. Say, uh, Blakey, that lead dog there, he's new, ain't he? Why, I guess you could call it that. Uh, that's Marco's dog. Marco traded with me. He, uh, he figured I'd be running closer to the storm, so I'd need a better lead dog than he would, so he, uh... He traded with me. I see. You see what? What's this all about? You act like it's a matter of life and death. The four of us talked it over while Blakey was unpacking his sled. It didn't add up. We agreed on that. At least it didn't add up the way Blakey was claiming. He was a born liar, we knew that, and Marco should have been at the trading post by now even if he had stopped off at Jackson River. Well, when Blakey came in, we ate, and then we waited some more. Still no sound of another dog slip, or Marco. Wind seems to be slacking off some. Eh, blizzard ain't far off. Wind always slacks off first. Who's for game of pinochle? with all of you. You ain't spoke one decent word to me since I got here. Anybody think I was a wolf and sneaked in out of the woods or something? Well, why don't somebody say something? How'd you get that bruise under your eye, Blakey? How'd you get that bruise? You sit around and stare at me for a couple of hours and then the only thing you can think of to say is how'd you get that bruise? What happened? Did you get in a fight with somebody? I got the bruise from a rock. But how? I was working in the tunnel we drove. Some rock fell out of the roof and a piece of it hit me. That's how I got it. You're lying. What's the matter with you, Belle? You're lying, I said. You fought with Marco. That's how you got it. I ain't fought with nobody. Why would I fight with him? We was partners. Was, Blakey? I, I mean, are. We still are. What did you fight about, Blakey? Nothing. We didn't fight about nothing. You've got to have some reason, Blake. Your partners don't start fighting over nothing. I mean, we wasn't fighting. Look, I don't know why Marco in here. I ain't his mother. Maybe he changed his mind. He said he was going to be here. That's all I know about it. Then why isn't he? He left before you did. You said so yourself. Where is he, Blakey? I don't know. What's the matter with all of you? You think I killed him or something? Yeah. What? That's right, Blakey. We think maybe you killed him. Oh, come off of it. You're out of your mind. You, you, you're kidding. That's what it is, a joke, huh? <laughs> Me killing old Marco. <laughs> That's a laugh for you. <laughs> you're going to tell us about it, huh? About what? There ain't nothing to tell. Look, if I had done something, why would I come straight here where you're all friends of his, where you're expecting him? Where else would you go? Well, to Jackson River. They don't have room to put a man up. All right, I could head for Dawson or south to Whitehorse. Storm too close, no time. Here only place. All right, answer me one thing. Why? Why do you think I'd kill him? Show him, Leclerc. Yeah. This might be the reason, Blakey. You've been going through my stuff. You got no right. We did it anyway. Now, what about this? I was going to tell you about that. I figured I'd wait and make it a kind of surprise. Surprise? It's rich quartz, Blakey. Must have opened up quite a pocket. It's the richest load between here and Mackenzie Bay. Not rich enough for two? Marco didn't even know about it. I stumbled onto it after he'd already left. That's why I was keeping it for a surprise. These two, Blakey? Were you keeping these for a surprise? I gave him those gloves and that writing tablet. And I knitted that pair of socks last winter. Well, 
He told me to pack up anything he'd missed, bring it along. That proves he was figuring to come here. Why? Well, look, I know you're worried about Marco and all. Do you? But you think in the wrong way, all of you. You're all, you're all wrong. You're mixed up. You're saying you didn't kill Marco. But you ain't saying it very good. Joe, show him what you found in the sled. You've got no right to bother my things. This. That's your knife, Blakey? It was a fox. I shot it on the trail. Skinned it for the dogs. That's how the blood got on it. You skinned fox. What'd you do with skin? I left it. I'm a miner, not a trapper. I don't know anything about skins. Now look, the whole bunch of you. I'm getting fed up with this. Questions accusing me. What do you think you are, a court of some kind? I don't have to answer anything. I ain't on trial. I'm going to turn in. Next morning, the barometer dropped again, and we knew that blizzard would hit any minute. All that day, we sat huddled around that wood stove, not talking, just thinking about Marco and Blakey. And just after dark, Blakey went outside to settle his dog team. By the time he came back in, we decided. What are you all staring at? Blakey, we're going to give you a trial. A trial for what? Jury of your peers. That's the only law we got. That's all we're likely to have till spring. Robertson bypassed as he got on through to Dawson to beat the blizzard. It's just you and us, Blakey. You're crazy. You ain't the law. Now, if you got anything to say in your own defense, any explanation... I ain't it. doing no more talking. You can't do nothing to me. Whatever you say, Blakey. Let's vote. Get it over with. If he won't talk... There ain't no use asking him anything else. I say he killed Marco. One vote guilty. Two. Of course he did it. Joe? He killed. There's three guilty and mine makes four. That's unanimous, Blakey. And just what do you aim to do about it? Well, we got to decide. Well, I'll decide for you. You ain't gonna do nothing. And you know why? Because of this. Grab him, Joe. Hold it. But don't none of you move. Looks a little different now, don't Put it? Put it down, Blakey. That rifle won't get you out of this. It won't, huh? Well, I'd say it's made some changes already. Four to one. You felt mighty big, didn't you? Well, how do you feel now? Things is kind of even up a little, ain't they? You can't hold us at gunpoint all winter. I ain't figuring to. I'm getting out of here. And none of you better try to stop me. Where are you planning to go? That's my business. But I sure ain't going to stay around here no longer. Now, all of you, stay right where you are. He's crazy. Where could he get to? Nowhere's maybe, but he ain't thought that far. All he knows right now is he's going to get away. Well, what are you going to do about it? Get your rifles. We go after him. <laughs> You are listening to Judgment Day at Crippled Deer, tonight's presentation of Escape. Saturday night on CBS Radio's thrilling Western series called Gunsmoke, meet United States Marshal Matt Dillon. Marshal Dillon faces another problem this Saturday, a problem as real and vital as the Old West itself, and just as full of action as well. Don't miss the exciting, unusual drama on CBS Radio's Gunsmoke, Saturday night on most of these stations. And now, Escape and the second act of Judgment Day at Triple Deer. Tracking down a fellow man is not a pleasant thing, even though he's crazed with fear. But there was no choice. The four of us stood a moment longer looking at the door that had slammed shut behind Blakey and then... Ready? Yeah. Yeah, let's get it over with. Come on. Don't let him get away. Joe, you sick and you pick up his trail. He couldn't have got far. He ain't had enough time. 
here. What? Tracks start here. Come. Oh. It's pitch dark to me. How can you see any tracks? Me see. Come. He seems to be heading back on the trail. On foot, without even snowshoes. He's out of his mind. Guilt and fear, they do funny things to a man. Leave trail now. Turn this way. Oh. Into the woods. Come. <laughs> Ron, get away from them. That's all he could think about there in the cabin. Crazy, clean out of his senses. Go on back. Stay away from me. He's holed up in that storage shed up on the creek bank. I saw the flash. Why don't we leave him there? Let him get snowed in. Let him starve. No, no, no. When a man begins to starve, he gets dangerous. He has that rifle and there's a whole case of ammunition in that shed. He could hang around the cabin and pick us off one at a time. Me go. Me bring him. You think you can slip up on him, Joe? You talk. Shoot guns. Make noise. I go. Yeah. Blakey! Get out of here. Go back to the post. Maybe this will shake him up a little. <laughs> You're wasting your time. I got cover and you ain't. That dirty murderer. I'll blast him out of there no, if it's no, the last no. thing I hold do. Hold it. You might hit the Indian. Why don't you tell us about it, Blakey? About Marco? Get it off your chest. Where did you bury him? I didn't bury nobody. You mean you left him for the wolves? If you don't stop saying that, I'll get every last one of you before. Hey. Joe must have got inside. You come now. Everything all right. No trouble. You come. All right. Let's go get him. <laughs> dragged him back to the post. We tied his hands together behind his back and locked him in one of the bunk rooms. Then we sat, the four of us. We didn't say much. Not looking at one another, knowing what we had to decide. Putting it off as long as we could. And then it was Bell who had been in love with Marco and was ready not to go to pieces any minute. Finally brought it out in the open. We can't sit here and put it off all winter. We gotta decide what we're gonna do. Get it over with. I suppose you're right. You know I'm right. What's the matter with all of you? What are you afraid of? It's a big responsibility, Bell. Not from me. Maybe you can feel sympathy for him, but I don't. He don't even count. A hundred of him wouldn't make up for Marco. Perhaps you're right, Bell, but what I was thinking, Storm ain't hit yet, and as long as there's a chance Robertson will still come, well, maybe we ought to wait and leave it to him. After all, he's a law. It's his job. Red coat no come now. Blizzard too close. You go very fast to Dawson. No one spend winter here. Uh, Joe is right. We can't figure on turning Blakey over to the police. Robertson's already probably in Dawson. And we can't try to keep him prisoner clear through the winter. I guess we all agree on that. You know what I agree on. So I guess we better make up our minds, huh? Mine's made up now. You know that. Yes, I know that, Bell. Love, my people say... Man who killed friend must die always. I don't know, LeClaire. Killing a man in a fight or a battle when you're crazy mad, that's one thing. But doing it in cold blood like this, well, it ain't easy to face it. It ain't the same. I guess we all feel that way about it. None of us want to do it. it looks to me like we don't have much choice. We don't, and the sooner the better. I don't know. The Mountie might still come. Make up your mind, Higgins. If you're afraid, say so. Well, it ain't that. You agree with the rest of us, then, or don't you? Yeah, I agree. Well, it's settled, then. Well, we might as well get it over with, huh? How are you thinking to do it, LeClaire? Well, hanging, that's the usual way, I guess. That roof pole outside the front of the cabin, we could take him up on the roof and tie the other end of the rope to that pole. Hmm? And then... And then make him step off. How much of a fall does it take? I only seen it done once, down in the States. Wouldn't do to have it go wrong. 
No call for him to suffer any more than this. No, we do careful. We plan it all out. Stop huh? talking about it and do it. Do it and get it over with. We're going to, Bell. Well, get on with it. Oh, Joe, get a ladder up against the eaves out there, huh? Higgins and me, we cut a piece of rope. Good. No, I guess we better tell him. Hang me. You've decided to hang me. Blakey. You don't even know what you're saying. People don't sit down and decide they're going to hang somebody and expect to get away with it. You can't take the law into your own hands. You're just making it harder for us, Blakely. Harder for you? I'll make it harder for you when Robertson shows up. Robertson ain't going to show up. You're out of your minds. We're going to have to drag you, Blakey. You'll drag nobody. I'll walk. See just how far you're planning to go with this. All right, we go out through the main room. Bell. Bell, you know what they're figuring to do? Yeah. We'll do something. Stop them. You're a woman, Bell. You, you, you're different. I wish there were ten of you, Blakey. So they could hang you ten times instead of once. Bell. Get him out of here. Take him out and get it over with. Yeah, come on. She's crazier than the rest of you. It's all crazy. It's all like a nightmare. Watch your step, LeClaire. That crust is freezing. It's slick. Yeah, yeah. Like it ain't real. It really happened. Not to me, anyway. You know, that wind has died down some. Always does, just before the blizzard hits. All right, Blakey. Climb up on the roof. Roof? Yeah, and you climb the ladder, you want us to help you. I can climb. You go up there by the ridge pole, Blakey, up there where Joe is standing. Yeah, better let me help you. A lot of snow on the roof. Made easy with your hands tied that way. All ready, roof tied. Everything ready. Oh. Well, might as well we get on with it, huh? Uh, maybe you better tie it around his neck, LeClaire. Huh? Uh, you seen it done once. If I can remember. Hey, Blakey, come stand closer to the edge here, huh? Uh, careful, LeClaire. It's, it's dark. Don't slip. Yeah, that's fine. Right there now. Well, it, it, it's right. a joke, huh? That's what... You, you gents are just trying to scare me so we can laugh about no, it after. Hold still, Blakey. <laughs> a joke. Hold still. A real good joke. All right, that's tight. <laughs> that, that's very is. funny. Well, it, <laughs> looks like we're ready. Yeah. Well, you got any last words, Blakey? I guess you better say them now. You jump now. Joe. You jump. Stop pushing. You <laughs> jump now. <laughs> inside, we left him swinging their figure to take him down in daylight and bury him. I opened a bottle of brandy and we drank some fast in gulps. We needed it because it wasn't easy to do it. Not in cold blood that way. It didn't change much either when we stopped to think about it. It didn't bring Marco back to life, killing Blackie. Even Bell, who was crazy for revenge, was feeling sick. Then we got to thinking about Robertson, too, how he never missed stopping by before on his last trip out to Dawson. And then Joe heard it. Dogs! Here, dogs! Sled come! Robertson! I told you. I told you we ought to wait. Now we're in for we it. We gotta do something. We gotta think of something to tell him, make up a story. What, with Blake, he's still hanging out there? What story? But we gotta do something. All we can do is tell him the truth and hope he sees it the way we did. He's an old timer in the North. He'll understand. We'll make him understand. He'll be snowed in with us here. All us together for the rest of the winter, we'll make him understand. We did right. At least we know it. I think he will. Got a steak and a drink for a hungry man? Well? Marco. Marco! Why all the surprise? I promised you I'd be here, didn't I, Bill? 
Stopped over a couple of days in Jackson River. Dang, they got snowed in. Say, did uh, Blakey make it all right? He was going to leave the mine a couple of days after I did. Under the direction of Norman McDonald, Escape has brought you Judgment Day at Triple Deer by Les Crutchfield, starring Lawrence Dobkin with Harry Bartell. Featured in the cast were Lou Krugman, Georgia Ellis, James Nusser, and Clayton Post. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are standing alone in a mountain village somewhere in the puppet country of Andorra. The high crags of the Pyrenees trapping the last of the daylight. And you know that in one of the stone houses facing you, behind one of the doors that is closed against you, is a beautiful woman whom you must find before she meets her death. So listen next week when Escape brings you Kathleen Height's story, The Wall. Saturday night on CBS Radio, gangbusters reveal the true facts behind a fantastic hotel holdup in which three comical bad guys with a wicked sense of humor terrorize Manhattan hotel guests, rob them, and vanish into the night after commandeering the hotel for their own high profit without interference. Hear gangbusters through crime case history Saturday night on most of these stations. Listen while you work. Enjoy young Dr. Malone every Monday through Friday in the daytime on the CBS Radio Network. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are standing alone in a mountain village somewhere in the puppet country of Andorra. The high crags of the Pyrenees trapping the last of the daylight. And you know that in one of the stone houses facing you, behind one of the doors that is closed against you, is a beautiful woman whom you must find before she meets her death. Listen now as Escape brings you Kathleen Height's story, The Dark Wall. quiet of the night settled over us. I could hear only the silky ripple of the river Segre nearby and a thin whisper of wind in the high pines above us. The strained silence of the day was over. Joyce was sleeping quietly now, a few feet away. I sank into my sleeping bag and prayed that things would go better tomorrow. Something roused me. Some sound. In a glance, I saw the gray of the pre-dawn, and then I saw Joyce. Poised at the side of my sleeping bag, wild terror in her eyes, and in her upraised hand, a heavy tire iron. Joyce! But you wake up, Alan, don't! Joyce, for heaven's sake, give that to me! No, 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 I've got Give it to me, let go, let go! Let go, drop it, let it go! No, I won't! Don't, Alan! Let it go! Joyce! Oh, you were supposed to wake up. Why? Why did you have to wake up? Oh, Alan, Alan, I'm so afraid. No, no, you're all right, Joyce. Joyce, don't be afraid. No. Oh, Alan, what's wrong? What's wrong? There's nothing to be afraid of. It's so so awful to be so frightened. Well, what frightens you? Can't you tell me? I was going to kill you. You, What? I 
wanted to kill you. Hey, Joyce, are you afraid of me? No, it isn't you. I love you. And I love you, darling. Oh, I know you do. Alan, please, can't we go now? Can't we get away from here? I knew now that Joyce needed care, quickly. Her sickness, whatever it was, had been a growing thing. As we drove through the narrow, winding roads of the Pyrenees toward the tiny state of Andorra, I tried to forget what had happened. Tried to ignore the mounting wall of silence between us. Something in that silence told me that Joyce's fears were greater than mine. Why are you stopping here? Uh, the road forks up there just ahead. I want to look at the maps. I'm not sure which way we're supposed to turn. Aren't there any towns? Well, are we ever going to see people and buildings again? We can't be too far from Mandora La Vieja, but I doubt if this road we're on is even on the map. Then let's go back, Alan. Uh, let's see now. If we don't know what's ahead, let's go back to Lerita or Barcelona. Anywhere but here. It was a long way back, Joyce. I don't care. This place, all tanglewood and pines, the narrow paths that twist and wander. <laughs> We're not lost, darling. Then where are we? I don't like it, Alan. It's just a wild, lonely place. And it frightens me, and I beg you to take me out of here. All right, all right, darling. Don't worry. I know what's behind me. The head, it's all unknown. I'm afraid of what's ahead. No, you mustn't be afraid, Joyce. I won't let anything happen. We wound steadily higher and higher through the wooded Pyrenees. We met no one and saw no one. Andorra is a small state, only 192 square miles in all, but... That morning, it was an endless, stretching, climbing no-man's land. A lonely place with no name and no face. Then finally, we came upon it. Not a town, really. A village with one great house and a few smaller ones. Perched there on the rocky ledge, it looked like the last stop before oblivion. It's so quiet. I wonder where the people are. I wonder if there are people. It's not a town at all. Perhaps we should have turned back when you said to. Look. Huh? Look at the window. Where? Why, well, I know I saw a face in the window. Oh? There's someone here, Alan. Someone. No, you don't want to stay here, darling. Even if we find someone, this isn't the place for us now. Look, you see? The door, it's opening. Alan, someone is here. But, Joyce, this isn't the... You have lost your way? If we were told there was a, a town here. There is. Well, is this all there is to it? We do not require more. Please. I'm tired. I need rest. Can't we stay here? Is there a, a hotel? Any place where we can get a room? There is what your eyes tell you there is. And no more. Is there a larger town anywhere near here? You are in Andorra. Nothing is far away. Nothing is easily reached. What's the matter with you people? Must you always talk in riddles? Can't you answer questions? Alan, Can't please, you... Uh... Please. Okay. We must stay here somehow. Just a while. I need to stop a while. She is your wife? Yes. There is no hotel. I see there isn't. This house has many rooms, but we are a large family. Please. Please, understand me. I've got to stay here. I can't wind around any more narrow trails. I've got to stop and rest. Can't you understand? Can't I make either of you understand? Y darling, it's, it's all right. We'll find a room. You'll rest. Now, you mustn't worry, Joyce. I must sleep. I must. No matter what happens, I must sleep. Can't you do something? Lady, you come. Woman! Almost as soon as he called, a squat little woman appeared in the doorway. They exchanged only a look, and then she came and led Joyce into the house. 
At first, I thought the man meant for me to stay outside. He moved as if to stop me from following. And then he stepped back, and I walked into the house. Joyce was stretched out on the bed when I got there. The bed was the only piece of furniture in the room. Mm. Mm, it's nice, isn't it, Alan? Well, it's a room, a bed. I wish it were more. Oh, I'm so tired. Yes, darling. Now you go to sleep. When you wake up, as soon as you feel like it, I'll take you to Andorra la Vieja. Mm, yes, Alan. When I wake up. <laughs> sleep well, darling. She sleeps? Oh, she's very tired. The woman says she trembled. The woman says she is full of fear. I don't suppose there's a doctor anywhere around here. We have no need for doctors. My wife is ill. We have need for a doctor. You will not find one here. I know. I know. Hey. What? Hey. Hey, get away from that car. Go on now. I, I said get, a, get away from the... Get away from it. You are the intruder, not they. Well, they can leave the car alone. They have. Who are they? My sons, my brothers, their sons. We are the family here. We are called Valera. We tend sheep and our own affairs. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm worried about my wife. I, I didn't mean to shout at them. Most of the time, our mountains protect us. We do not like intruders. It is not so bad in winter. The snows fall deep into the passes, seal them, and keep the intruders out. We are not intruders. We don't want to be here. We don't mean to be here. And I promise you, we won't be here long. Sometimes the intruders come to hide in our mountains, to be lost from the world. Always, the intruders are troubled people, full of fears and discontent. The worst of the world, they find their way to Andorra. I walked away from him, along the crude cobble of the village path, away from the great house and the smaller ones. And everywhere, the sons, the brothers and their sons of Valera watched me with silent distrust. I walked to the rocky pinnacle that was the edge of the village, and beyond, as far as I could see, the awesome Pyrenees reached higher and higher, like a great wall closing out the rest of the world. I went back to the house where Joyce slept. The woman is with her. She called out, and the woman went into her. Well, I shouldn't have left her alone. I must... Wait. Huh? The woman has brought her quiet. That is enough. I wouldn't try to keep me out here if I were... How is she, woman? She is quiet now. The woman would not leave her so if she were not Joyce. quiet. Joyce! Oh, Joyce, darling. They said you'd gone. No, 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 no. Only for a little while. Only while you slept. Don't... What? Don't come any closer. Oh, Joyce. What is it? Please. Leave me alone. I want you to leave me alone. Oh, we're going to get out of this place, darling, together. No. No, I won't go. I won't. We'll find the right road. It can't be far. And I promise you, darling, everything will be all right. We won't come here again, ever. Why don't you listen? Huh? I talk to you and you don't listen. I'm not going with you. You can't make me go with you. No, 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 no. Oh, jo Joyce, wait. Oh, don't let him take me away. Don't. Oh, please, oh, please don't. Joyce was clinging to the woman. Valera stepped in front of them as I came back to the front room, and beside him, from every corner of the room, the rest of the Valera men began to form a wall between Joyce and me, a wall of men, silent men, with staring distrust in their eyes. What are you trying to do? Oh, can't you see she's sick? I've got to get her out of here, don't you know that? I'm taking her with me. And the whole lot of you can't stop me. Hey, you! Ah! 
You are listening to The Dark Wall, tonight's presentation of Escape. One advantage in having several radios about the house is that they make it possible for housewives to listen while they work. A kitchen set, another in the living room, perhaps a third in the bedroom. Keep them all tuned into CBS Radio for our great roster of daytime dramatic stories. And now, Escape and the second act of The Dark Wall. I roused from a sleep that was tortured and full of pain. A bright afternoon sun shone in a haze about me, and when my vision cut through it, I saw nothing my eyes had seen before. I was in my own car, pulled to one side of a road that was wider than any I'd seen for days. And not far in the distance, I could hear the approach of other cars, but none were yet in my view. I got out, stood in the roadway. For all the stiff pain of me, it felt good to be a part of the world again. But then I remembered Joyce and the wall of Valera men, and, and I, I was lost and lonely and sick. Hey, you should not walk in the middle of the road. No. No, no, I shouldn't, only... Uh, you are hurt? An accident? No, I, I'm all right. I, I just don't know where I am. What road is this? Oh, you're in Andorra. You know that? I, I know that. Then, straight ahead on this road, the direction your car is pointing. Huh? No more than four kilometers lies the capital, Andorra la Vieja. Straight ahead, uh, Andorra la Vieja. I promise, I have just come through there myself. You are sure you are right? Not here? No, no, I'm, I'm much better now. Do you know this country well? Oh, well enough to drive through it quickly. My home is in Spain. You wouldn't know a village near here, maybe a, a small village where everyone is called Valera? No, I would not know it. There are many such villages in Andorra, if you can find them. I must find it. Perhaps in Andorra la Vieja? Perhaps. <laughs> My hopes were high for Andorra la Vieja. There would be answers for all my questions. There would be concern and help and interest. I told myself these things to keep my mind from filling itself with Joyce. To keep the pain quiet. Some corner of my mind held the memory of all that had happened in the house of Valera. I could not be sure I wanted to remember. I do not see why you have come here to me. Well, I didn't know any place else to go. I need so much help. I thought surely the police could do something. There has been a crime? No, my, my wife is ill. Very ill. She's with strange people in a strange village. I've got to find help for her and, and go back there. Then why do you not do this? Why do you bother me? I've told you. Will you try to understand me? I don't know where the village is. I don't think it's far away, but... I don't know where it is. It has a name, the village? I don't know that. The people there are called Valera. There is a river called Valera. No, I, I saw no river. No, not there. It was high, on a rocky crest of a mountain, just a few houses. You must know where it is. You were there? Yes, this morning. Then you must know where it is. No, I don't. I don't have any idea where it is. But you were there this morning. And now you are here. Look... I don't know how I got there. Can I make you understand that? I think none of this is important. Well, it's all important to me. My wife is ill. She needs care. You tell me that. Perhaps then you would tell me why you left her in a strange village you do not know, with strange people you do not know. I... I didn't leave her. But she is there. And you are here. Oh. You won't even try to help me. Help you? Help you what? 
Find a town where you have been and I have never been? All right. All right. Uh, uh, I can't talk anymore. Uh, there is a hotel across the plaza. You will find other intruders there. Among them, a doctor. I wasn't sure I'd heard him clearly, but there were no questions left in me. I stumbled out into the glaring sunlight again, steadied myself against a pillar, and, and when I could make out the hotel across the plaza, I walked there, held together, I know, by the thin strand of hope that I would find the doctor and there would be help for Joyce. Here, yeah. drink it, Don. Oh, Hey, whiskey? <laughs> it's good whiskey. You need it. Oh. Mm. oh good. Yes, it helps. But you do understand, Doctor, that I have not come about me. You're your wife. I know. I understand that. Oh, I'm glad someone does. You think the priest can help us? You think he he'll be able to find the village? Oh, the padre will direct us there, if anyone can. Uh, meanwhile, there's time. Now, tell me about your wife as, as much as you can, as much as you know of her illness. Well, I've called it illness. I suppose it's that. Fear. Unreasonable fear is an illness, isn't it? Oh, indeed it is, yes. Has she known these fears long? Uh, I don't know. We've been married less than a month. I knew her only a short time before that. No, it was all pretty sudden. She was alone, I was alone, and then we were together. Did you were uh, happier together? Oh, yes. Very happy. Very much in love. Until this strangeness came over her. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, may I? Oh, uh, please do help yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, how was it you described the, uh, the difference in her, the difference in your relationship? <laughs> like, like a wall, a mounting wall of silence. Uh -huh. Uh, and in this silent time of hers, she is much different? Not at all like the girl you married? She doesn't even look like herself. Her lovely, gentle face contorts into a, a wild thing. Like she was an animal. Oh, it's ugly, Doctor, and so real. I couldn't imagine that, could I? No, I don't believe you could. Uh, she was like that early this morning when she tried to kill you? She kept saying that she had to kill me, that she wanted to kill me. Uh, and all the while, she was so frightened... So very frightened. Yeah. But do you know what frightened her? Do you know any reason why she should want to kill you? Well, I thought she must be afraid of me. She'd have no reason to be, but I thought that must be it. I asked her and she said, it isn't you. I love you. Oh, the poor darling. And she said that after she tried to kill you? Almost immediately afterward. It's a complete contradiction, I know, but that's the way it is. It, as if Joyce were two persons. Two directly opposite persons. That may be precisely the case, you know. I don't understand. Two persons. One almost entirely good, gentle, kind. The other almost entirely evil, terrifying, menacing. Fiendish at times. Two persons occupying one body. That's schizophrenia. Oh, no. No, not Joyce, Doctor. Oh, I'd have no. to be sure, of course. But from what you've said... No, it's still, I'd have to see her, talk with her... Or well, there are many steps to take. No, the important thing now is to see her as soon as possible. Schizophrenia, that's hopeless, isn't it? I mean, there's no cure, is there? Well, it depends largely, I should say, on how long these two personalities within her have been warring one with another, the good and the evil and the moral and the immoral. If the cleavage is minor at this point, if the breach between her two selves, as it were, is not yet great... Oh, and there is a measure of hope. But she couldn't go on this way indefinitely, being two people. Mustn't one of herselves, as you say, win this war? If it progresses unchecked, well, then, yes, oneself will emerge triumphant. Uh, which is a poor war word here, for in such an instance, the evil almost inevitably triumphs over the good. Can we go to her now? Yes, I'm sure the party will have our directions. <laughs> The priest's directions were perfect. As I'd assumed, the village was not far away, but the drive was an eternity for me. The strain of the last days was beginning to tell. I, I was wound tight and knotted by all that had happened and torn deep by all the doctor had said. I stopped outside the great house of Valera. The doctor 
touched my arm. Uh, perhaps, um, perhaps it's best that I see her alone uh, at first. Oh, but, but I've got to see her. Oh, I know, and you will, but you don't know what happened here before you left. The last you remember, she was terrified of you. I'll send for you soon, I promise. Tell her I love her. Will you? Oh, indeed I will. Oh, uh, there's one thing I neglected to tell you, one important facet of this. Yeah. If we find what we fear most, you must take this comfort to your heart. A girl you love, who loves you, has no knowledge whatsoever of her other self. Thank you, Doctor. Yes, you ponder that. I shan't be long. I watched the house door close behind him. And there in the high quiet alone, I took the comfort he offered me. The choice I loved. Loved me. That was all there was, really. All in the world I needed to know. You will not go in there. The woman, the doctor, they have brought her quiet again. I am going in. I will kill any or all of you who stand in the way. Move. Move! There. Anyone else want his head bashed in? <laughs> Good. We'll make a real mess of things, won't we? Come on. I like to crack skulls. What's the matter? Come on. Keep me from that door. Make one little move and I'll tear you loose. Men of honor, I see. Where is she? Don't let him. Don't let him try to kill me again. Look at her. Look at all of your crawling, shrinking cowards. What are you, gentlemen? <laughs> you make me sick, all of you. I killed him, you know. He was a gentleman, dear, gentle Alan. No. He won't be with us anymore. Oh, please. Please, somebody do something. Easy now. Somebody will. Come on. No. No. I, I'll tell you, Joyce, what I, what I told him. And you must take this comfort to your heart. Alan, the man you loved, loved you very much. He didn't know this other self ever existed. There were faces all around me. A wall of faces, senseless, staring faces. And beyond them, a strange girl wept softly. All strangers, strangers staring at me. And I stared back at the wall. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Dark Wall by Kathleen Height, starring John Daner with Joyce McCluskey. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Edgar Barrier, Nestor Piva, and Fritz Feld. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. (laughs) 
you are in a farmhouse on the southern coast of England. The autumn countryside around you desolate and bleak. And you know that in the dusk outside, waiting patiently for you, silently watching for you, is an enemy from whom there may be no escape. So listen next week when Escape brings you Daphne du Maurier's story, The Birds. A reminder for drama and adventure fans, two of CBS Radio's best-known thrillers, Gangbusters and Gunsmoke, both heard Saturday nights, will be moving to Monday evenings on most of these same stations after this Saturday's performances. Follow the latest crime clues and true crime-smashing drama on Gangbusters this Saturday night, and don't miss U.S. Marshal Matt Dillon's latest Western adventure on Gunsmoke the same evening. Then, after this Saturday, remember to listen for them both on their new night starting next Monday, July 5th. Listen while you work. Enjoy Our Gal Sunday, Monday through Friday on the CBS Radio Network. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are in a farmhouse on the southern coast of England. The autumn countryside around you desolate and bleak. And you know that in the dusk outside, waiting patiently for you, silently watching for you, is an enemy from whom there may be no escape. Listen now as escape brings you Daphne du Maurier's story, The Bird. On December the 3rd, the wind changed overnight, and it was winter. Until then, the autumn had been mellow, soft. The earth was rich where the plow had turned it. I didn't do the plowing, no. My wartime disability had seen to that. They gave me mostly the lighter repair jobs to do in the three days a week that I worked at the farm. A bank to build up or a gate to mend at the far end of the peninsula where the sea surrounded the farmland on either side. Deborah and I had taken a cottage up here to try again for the sake of the children. And it seemed to be working fairly well. I enjoyed my work on the farm. It was pleasant to pause at midday to eat the lunch that Debbie prepared and brought to me. We'd sit there on the cliff while I ate and we'd watch the birds. There are many of them, Matt. Yes. Well, the autumn's better than spring for watching them. Oh, why? Oh, well, in the spring, they're content, they're full of purpose, they know where they're going, there's no delay. But then in autumn, it's different. The birds that don't migrate seem to follow a A pattern of their own. Pattern? Hmm. Great flocks of them here on the peninsula. Restless, uneasy, wheeling, circling, coming to rest, and flying again. The land birds and the gulls down there in the bay. Strange sort of rhythm in their movements. They don't really go anywhere. Doesn't seem to be any purpose to it. No. Well, if there is, we don't see it. The restlessness. And they're more restless this year than usual, it seems to me. Do you know this morning two gulls flew so close they knocked off my cap? Jill said yesterday when the school bus let her off, there was quite a few of them overhead as if they'd been followed. Oh, well, I suppose it means a hard winter. They always seem to know. Perhaps a message comes to them in autumn. A warning. About winter. And about death. Nat. Many of them will die, and I think they know it. 
Perhaps they feel they have to spill their emotion out before they die. Like people who know their time is up and run about stupidly driving themselves. I wish you wouldn't talk like that, Nat. That that black side of you that stirred up the trouble between us before. Oh, I'm sorry, Debbie. But it, it's come over me lately as I've watched them. The land birds mingling with the sea birds in a sort of strange, unnatural partnership. Land and sea. And life and death. That night it turned colder, yet the wind strengthened. Around two in the morning, the sound of it beating against the house woke me up. I lay there with this slow, even breathing of Debbie beside me, and I thought of Jill and Johnny in the room across the hall. We seemed safe, secure. And then I heard it, a tapping on the window. At first I thought it was a loose shutter, and then I realized it wasn't. I got out of bed, went to the window, opened it. Suddenly something brushed against my hand and jabbed at my knuckles, and then was gone over the roof and behind the cottage. Nat, what's it? Oh, it's all right, Debbie. It was a bird. I don't know what kind. Bird? Hmm. Wind must have driven it against the window, so my hands wet. It's blood. Hmm? A little beggar drew blood. Go to sleep, Matt. Uh, must have been frightened and stabbed at me in the dark. Well, for the Matt, the window seat you are just rattling. I've already seen to it. It's some bird trying to get in. Send them away. I can't sleep with that noise. All right. All right. Oh, I'll laugh with you. But, why, little... Stay away from my face. Get out! Get away! Here. There. There. There's the world. Did you see that? There were half a dozen this time. They, they went for me. They tried to peck my eyes. Oh, Dad. I'm not making it up there. Follow me! Huh? What? It's Jill. Go see what's the matter. Right. Oh, Coming, Jill. <laughs> he keeps flying at me. Where's Johnny? Uh-uh, just flying at What's the matter? Quick, oh, get the children out of here. Bird! <laughs> Get the children out of here and shut the door, quick! I pushed them out of the room, and now I was alone with the birds. I seized a blanket, and I used it as a weapon, sweeping it right and left. And I could hear the thud of bodies, but they kept coming at me. They are jabbing my hands, my head, trying for my eyes with beaks as sharp as pointed forks. And I wrapped the blanket around my head, beat about with my bare hands, blindly. I don't know how long I fought them. Finally, the beating of wings lessened, and then I still I unwrapped the blanket from my face. The cold gray dawn had seeped into the room. The floor was littered with the tiny corpses of the birds. Robins, finches, sparrows, larks. Some had lost feathers in the fight. The others had blood, my blood, on their beaks. Sickened, I went to the window... The fierce sea broke harshly in the day. But there was not a bird in sight. Not a sparrow chattered in the hedge. No early thrush or blackbird pecked on the grass for worms. There was no sound at all but the east wind and the sea. Nat? Uh, I'm all right, Debbie. Oh, I didn't know what... Oh, you're covered with blood. Some of it's the birds. Look on the floor. Oh, oh so many of them. Yeah. Fifty, I counted them. It's horrible. Come on, darling, I'll clean the room later when I have more stomach for it. Hmm? It must have been ghastly for Are you. the children all right? Yes, I've put Jill to work making tea. Johnny's in our bed just now asleep. Not why? The birds? Well, it must be the weather. The sudden change confused them. It has to be that. The tea's ready, Mummy. Oh, good. Did you drive away the birds? Yes, they're all gone now, Jill. 
I hope they won't come again. Perhaps if we put breadcrumbs for them outside the window, they'll eat that and fly away. Pastor. I've already had breakfast. I'd better hurry or I'll be late for the school bus. Bus? Uh, oh, uh, I'll walk with you to the road, Jill. Yes, I think that'd be a good idea. I'll go get my coat and book. I didn't want her to walk alone. Nat, they... They wouldn't come back again. Well, I... I'll go over to the farm and find out if they heard anything during the night. You keep all the windows and doors closed, Debbie, just to be on the safe side, hmm? Anyone about? Hello, Mr. Hawkins. Was the mister around, Mrs. Trigg? Uh, summer's about, but can you tell me where this cold is coming from? Russia? I've never seen such a change, and it's going on, the wireless says. Something to do with the Arctic Circle. Ah, uh, we didn't turn on the wireless this morning. Uh, <clears throat> fact is, we had uh, trouble in the night. Oh, kiddies poorly. No, no not exactly, no. We, we uh, had some trouble with birds. I, uh... Why, it sounds absurd, but they flew in the window and attacked us. Attacked you? No, Mr. Hawkins. No, I'm not making it up, Mrs. Trigg. There are 50 dead birds on the floor of the children's bedroom. Mm, foreign birds. No. No, the kind you see about here every day. Really? Well, you ought to write up and ask the Manchester Guardian. They'd have an answer for it. Hey, good morning, Hawkins. Uh, Mr. Trigg. Mr. Hawkins has been telling about some birds last night. Oh. They, uh... He says they attacked him. Attacked? Mm. Are you sure? Quite. Yeah. Never heard of a thing like that before. Hungry, maybe. Looking for food. Mm. You, you put out some crumbs. Yes, of course. I'll be up tomorrow as usual. Good morning. Mm. Ordinary birds, he says. Attacked him. Now, what does he take us for, coming around with a story like that? A strange one he is, with those superior airs. You see the look he gave us when we didn't swallow his story? Attacked him. I think he reads too many of those books. Oh, Nat, did you find out anything at the farm? No. The Trigg's brilliant advice was to put out some crumbs. Debbie, I looked all around this morning. There's not a single bird in sight outdoors. Quick, they've gone. I don't know. And the Triggs had no trouble last night. Not only that, they clearly thought I was imagining it. Oh, I heard Trigg mutter something about my superior airs and reading too many books as I walked away. Nothing's real to those clods until it hits them over the head. Well, they're nice enough people, Ned just that they're isolated up here. Well, that's certainly the polite word for it. I haven't been able to face going to the children's room. The birds... Oh, yes, I'll go and clean it up. I suppose the least I can do is give the little beggars a decent burial. I dropped the dead birds into a sack, went down to the beach to bury them. The wind was bitter cold. I dug a pit in the sand with my heel and started to empty the sack into it, but the wind caught the birds and whirled them along the shore. There was something ugly in the sight, that the tide would take them when it turned. I looked out at the crested breakers, and then I saw them, the gulls, out there riding the seas, thousands, tens of thousands. They rose and fell in the trough of the sea like a mighty fleet at anchor, waiting for the turn of the tide. Waiting. They stretched as far as my eye could reach. They covered the sea. I started up the steep path home, almost running. Someone should know of this. Someone should be told. But who... And then, as I opened the front door, I saw Watch Debbie beside the wireless listening. Damage and even attacking individuals. It is thought that the Arctic airstream is causing the birds to migrate south in immense numbers, and that intense hunger may drive them to attack human beings. 
Householders are warned to see to their windows, doors, and chimneys, and to take all precautions for the safety of their children. Further bulletins will be issued later. They've been repeating it every few minutes since you left. Well, perhaps now those empty-headed idiots at the farm will know that I was... You sound almost glad. Oh, don't talk rot, Debbie. It's just that when people with half a brain try to tell me that I... Can't you forget that superior attitude of yours, even now? Don't use that word superior to me. I'm sick of it. So am I, Nat. So am I. You... Oh, I... uh, I'm sorry, dear. This thing has made me a little nervy, I guess. Yes, I... I'm sorry, too, my dear. Nat, one of the bulletins said the birds seemed to be waiting. For what? I don't know. They said the birds are hungry. What are you doing? Oh, the hammer. I'm going to get some boards and see to the doors and windows as they tell you to. You think they could break in with the windows shut, the sparrows and robins and such? How could they? I wasn't thinking about the smaller birds. I was thinking about the gulls. The gulls? Debbie, have you ever been close enough to get a good look at a gull's beak? There must be a hundred thousand of them out there, riding the sea, waiting. The rest of the morning, I worked upstairs, boarding the bedroom windows. And I wondered whether they'd take these precautions up at the farm. I doubted it. It'd probably be a big joke to the Triggs. But according to the wireless, it was no joke. At first, some of the bulletins had been light in tone, but as the morning wore on, the concern in the announcer's voice became more and more apparent. Well, after I'd finished upstairs, I took the rest of the lumber down, boarded up the lower floor windows. What they ought to do is call the army out and shoot the birds. That would soon scare them off. Debbie, uh, uh, how are we off for food? Now, Nat, whatever next. Now, never mind. What have you got in the larder? It's shopping day tomorrow, you know that. I don't keep uncooked food hanging about. It goes off. But I can put some things in tomorrow. Tomorrow? It's only three in the afternoon and it's almost dark. What? Why, yes. The sky looks so heavy. Nat, what's the matter? You've gone quite white. Look. The tide's turned. The gulls. They've risen. Circling over the sea. Not a sound from them. Nat. I'm going for Jill. I'll wait for her at the bus stop. You keep Johnny inside and keep the door shut. Outside, I looked for a weapon, but a hoe was all I could find. Then I went to the top of the hill and waited. The surf was booming below, and a smudge rose behind the clay hills in the distance. It widened, divided, and spread north, east, south, west. It was a vast cloud of birds. It passed close by, heading inland, up country. They had no business with the people here on the peninsula. Rooks, crows, jackdaws, magpies, birds that usually preyed upon the smaller species. But this afternoon they were bound on some other mission. They've been given the towns, I thought. They know what they have to do. We don't matter so much here. The gulls will serve for us. The others go to the towns. And finally the bus came. When Jill got up, I took her by the hand. What's the home for, Daddy? Oh, I just brought it along. Come along now, darling. Let's go home. It's cold. No hanging about. Hmm? I want to play a bit in the rain. Not tonight. Now, come on. No dawdling. Look, Daddy. Look over there. Look at the gulls. They're flying in from the sea. They're so quiet. Yes, sir. Uh, do hurry, darling. Where are they flying to? Oh, up country, I dare say, where, where it's warmer. Don't go so fast. I can't keep up. Hurry. The gulls, it... They're circling. It looks like they're waiting for something. Yeah, for a signal, an order. What? Nothing. Come on, dear, faster. But I can't go faster. Uh, wait, wait. There's Trigg in his two-seater. Uh, looks as though we're in 
looking for some fun, Hawking. Have you heard the news? Everyone's gone bird crazy, talking of nothing else. I'm going to take a crack at them with my gun. Uh, could you run Jill home first? Oh, yes, of course. Not room for you, too, I'm afraid. Oh, that's all right. Just get Jill home. Get in, Julia. Would you like to come shooting with me? No, thanks. Have you boarded your windows? No. A lot of nonsense. They like to scare you on the wireless. I'd board them if I were you. Oh, go on. You're windy. Well, see you in the morning. I'll give you a gull breakfast. I watched Trigg drive Jill toward the cottage. And then I followed on foot. The sound made me look up. The gulls were approaching. The order had been given, and the farm was their target. The black-backed gulls were leading, and they were bigger birds. Gannets. Terns. And suddenly one of them dove at me, missed, rose to drive again, and then came the other six, seven, a dozen. I dropped the hole, covered my head with my arms, and ran towards the cottage. They kept coming at me from the air with beating wings. Each stab of a swooping beak tore my flesh. I had to keep them from my eyes. And with each dive, they became bolder. And they had no thought for themselves. When they missed, they crashed, bruised and broken on the ground. And as I ran, I stumbled, kicking their spent bodies in front of me. Now they aimed up better, closer to my eyes, closer. And then I reached the door of the cottage. Let me in! It's Nat! Let me in! And then, above me, I saw the gannet poised against the sky for his dive. The gulls drew back, only the huge gannet. The wings folded suddenly to its body, and it dropped like a stone at me. The door opened, and I flung myself in. Lord, what was that? A gannet. He'd have split my skull. Better now? Yes, thanks. You're, you're quite the wound dresser. Are the children? In the other room, I didn't want them to see you that way. No. Your hands are the worst. I'll be all right. We'd uh, better all sleep here in the kitchen tonight. I'll bring down the mattresses. All right. I'll fix something tasty for supper and wasn't prepared. Wait. Yes. That sound. What is it? The birds crowding against the outside of the house. They're trying to find a way in. Nat! No, they, they can't get in. I tell you, they cannot get in. The boards will hold. For how long? How long? Stop before... it! Here. I'll turn on the wireless. That'll drown them out. There. Yeah. Yeah, there, better. Yes. Anything so I can't hear the whole of it. It's only the food that worries me, Debbie. Now, I've noticed that the birds come in with the tide, but the tide will go out about nine tonight, and we should have a lull of about six hours. I could slip out during that time and go to the farm, see if they can give us this something. Here's lunch. A national emergency was proclaimed at four o'clock this afternoon. Yes. Measures are being taken to safeguard the lives and property of the population, but it must be understood that these are not easy to effect immediately, due to the unforeseen and unparalleled nature of the present crisis. It is absolutely imperative that everyone remain indoors until further notice. The birds, in vast numbers, are attacking everything in sight. The population is asked to remain calm and not to panic. There will be no further transmission from any broadcasting station until 7 a.m. tomorrow. It... like this all over, then. All over. Daddy. Go back, supper. Let's... Let's forget it. Let's all just try to get some sleep. Nat, hmm? wake up. Hmm? Nat, hmm? they're back again. But I... What time is it? A little after three. Ah, the tide's come in again. There's been a queer smell the last few minutes. Rather like burned feathers. What? Burned feathers? The chimney. I forgot to keep the fire up. They're coming down the chimney. No. Where's the oil? On the shelf. Yeah, they are. They're squeezing through the chimney. Stand back. They can throw the oil on the coal. That'll get them. Dad, Dad, I can't stand it. Get me paper, wood, anything. It'll burn. Hurry. 
Their charred bodies kept dropping down the chimney. I raked them to one side, but more came. I threw on the rest of the oil. We found papers on it, kindling, anything. The flames roared higher. More bodies. The stench was unbearable. I kept at it. Finally, they gave up. And I went over to the basin. I was sick. Around nine in the morning, the rustling ceased. I opened the door a crack. Crushed birds were deep about the house, but there was not a living bird in sight. The tide had gone out. Now was my chance to get food and fuel. I ran all the way to the farm. There was no smoke from the chimney. I came round the corner of the house and stopped in the doorway, almost covered with dead birds, were Mr. and Mrs. Trigg. What was left of them? Beside him was his gun. Beside her, a broken umbrella. I loaded the two-seater with all the food I could find, enough for perhaps three days, and drove back to the cottage. I told Debbie that Triggs didn't need their car for a while and had told me to take it. She said nothing. And towards nightfall, the birds came back again. We sat by the fire and listened to the rustle as they crowded against the house. But this time there was a new sound. They brought up their heavier forces against us, the birds with larger beaks. I could hear the sound of tiny bits of wood being torn away. They'll stay till the tide turns. Then they'll leave. Then they'll come back again. They'll keep coming back. Nat. Yes? The trigs. They're dead, aren't they? Yes. We're all alone. Strange. I keep closer to you than, than I've ever. That it should take something like this to bring us. <sighs> Debbie, you, you may be interested to know that right now, I do not feel very superior. Don't, Nat. Oh, Nat. I don't know, Debbie. I do not know. I listened to the sound of the splintering wood. And I wondered how many million years of memory were stored in those little brains behind the stabbing beaks, the piercing eyes. Now giving them this instinct to destroy mankind with all the depth precision of machines. I switched on the wireless. It was dead. I reached for the cigarettes. There was only one left in the packet. I lit it. I threw the empty packet on the fire and watched it burn. <laughs> Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Birds by Daphne du Maurier, specially adapted for radio by Robert Wright, starring Ben Wright with Virginia Gregg. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Ann Morrison, Ann Whitfield, and John Dodsworth. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. If you like your thrills to be real, your adventure to be true to life, Gangbusters is the show for you. Now every Monday night, most of these same CBS radio stations bring you the drama that names names, places, and dates in the nation's battle against crime. Stay tuned now for Night Watch, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Where there's gun smoke, there's Western adventure Monday nights on the CBS radio network. 
Stay tuned for Night Watch. Herman Hickman isn't the only exciting personality you'll want to hear. Right here at the Star's Address. Of course, where sports are concerned, the famous former football coach at Yale and one-time All-American player is a natural. And he's well worth listening for any Monday through Friday evening at 6.30. But when you're in the mood for musical entertainment, as you're likely to be any Monday through Friday morning at 9.30, Joan Edwards is the person to hear. The melodies she sings or plays each weekday morning are as sunny as her disposition. And her friendly personality only adds to the pleasure of listening to the Joan Edwards Show. Monday morning at 9.30 and every Monday through Friday morning at that time. Remember to tune in on happiness on our lighthearted... Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are standing in a moonlit clearing somewhere in the Burmese jungle, the ruins of an ancient temple at your back, while gliding silently across the grass towards you, the knife in her hand held pointing at you is the beautiful yet deadly high priestess of the cult you have profaned, the exotic girl who must now take your life. Listen now as Escape brings you Kathleen Height's story, Eye of Evil. studied Fairchild as he read the letter. He was not a man I would ordinarily turn to for help, but I was not acquainted at Mandalay. Then, too, he knew Campbell. I mean no slur against Fairchild. He was bright enough as government office clerks go. I had simply hoped for more formidable assistance. This is the last letter you received from Campbell? You know, the last word of any sort until I cabled him to meet me in Mandalay. He cabled back that he would and named this hotel at noon today. Mm. Well, he's only two hours late. Two hours doesn't mean much in Burma. I'm not especially concerned about these two hours. Mm, the letter, eh? Yeah. Well, I can't say I blame you. Odd sort of letter. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. No, nor to me. Nor to anyone at the Historical Society. I hate to suggest this, but it sounds as if the old boy is cracked a bit, wouldn't you say? That's more or less what I've been sent to find out. Uh, this part here, he says, I shall fail if where I look my eyes see no beauty. Mm. Can't deny it has a certain ring to it. When was the last time you saw Campbell? Oh, let me see. It was well before the rain set in. I, I should say a good six or eight weeks before. That would make it late February or early March. Well, Campbell's letter was posted here in Mandalay the 14th of May. You're certain you didn't see him around that date? No, positive. Uh, of course, just because it was posted here doesn't mean Campbell himself was in Mandalay. Oh? Uh, probably sent it up here from Pugan by Mang Ba. Mang Ba. Uh, Burmese boy, devoted to Campbell. Oh. oh. There have been all sorts of help to him with all that probing about he does around Pugan, ruddy ancient shrines and pagodas. The place is crawling with him, you know. Yes, yes, that's what I understand. Uh, Mung Ba does a lot of that sort of thing for Campbell. Aaron supplies, comes up the Irrawaddy by boat, you know. Uh -huh. There's no train down to Pugan from Mandalay. I don't suppose Campbell relishes the boat trip often. What was he like the last time you saw him? Seemed normal enough. We lunched here at the hotel just as we're doing. From what you've said, that's about four months or so ago. I guess a lot could happen to a man in four months. It could in Pugan. Nothing but those miserable pagodas and shrines. I don't take much to ruins myself. You've been there, haven't you, Lawrence? No, no, no. This is my first trip to Burma. Oh. Well, then might just give you a word about the people, all sorts, of course, but those around Pugan seem to be given to all manner of strange beliefs, superstitions, odd things. Well, the evil eye, for example. <laughs> you serious? Dead serious. Well, we can't be talking about the same thing. If I remember correctly, the archaic belief in the evil eye is that if one possesses it, anything or anyone he looks upon will die. Quite right. 
Only it isn't entirely archaic. It's a widespread belief in India, parts of Egypt, Arabia, and certainly here in Burma. Oh, that's fantastic. If I may, Loring, you're apt to find a great many things in Burma fantastic. Not so much in Mandalay, perhaps, or Rangoon, but around Kugan and to the west and north, there's a feeling, a mystic something that's been known to take hold of men. You're suggesting that Campbell... I don't know. You'd have to go there to find out. As Fairchild left me, something drew my attention across the room. She was alone. And quite possibly the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Utterly, strikingly beautiful. And the look in her eyes was a compelling invitation. In no time at all, I accepted. You were a very long time. <laughs> Matter of seconds after I saw you. But you were a long time seeing me. I have been looking at you for almost an hour. Uh, not like that, you haven't. No, I'd have known. I wonder... Your face, a very nice face, has been clouded with concern. And so would mine have been with your luncheon companion. <laughs> he was a bit drab, wasn't he? I saw no reason for you to spend more time with him. Gina decided you should spend your time with her. Gina. I like that. And I like the name... Stephen Loring. <laughs> How on earth could you know that? Either I have the gift of clairvoyance, or I paid to look at the hotel register. Oh, well, in either case, I'm flattered. And because I haven't much time, I agree with China. I should spend what time I have with her. How much time? Today. Um, perhaps tonight. And tomorrow? Uh, no, no. Tomorrow I'm off to Pugan and uh, feeling a mystic something that's been known to take hold of men. You joke about Pugan. Oh, no, no, not really. I was quoting my drab friend. I've never been to Pugan myself. I do not think you would like it there. Oh? Pugan is very different. I should think you would find Mandalay much more to your taste. I should think I would, too. And China, knowing Mandalay was strange to me, wrote out instructions that would lead me to our rendezvous that night, and, and she was gone. I found it difficult to believe our meeting had ever occurred, except that the memory of her was vivid and haunting. I lingered over a brandy and was preparing to leave the dining room. Greetings, Takin. Hmm? You are, I am certain, one Mr. Loring. <laughs> Is everyone in Burma clairvoyant? No, Takin. I am pleased to be Mungba. Who? Mungba. Oh, Campbell's friend from Pugan. Well, where is he? Isn't he with you? Regrettably not with Mungba. Esteemed friend remains in Pugan. Asks that you understand and kindly to return to Pugan with Mungba. Oh. Well, is, is anything the matter with Campbell? To say again, esteemed friend remains in Pugan. Asks that you understand and kindly to return to Pugan with Mungba. No, no, I understand you all right. I, I'm inquiring about Campbell. Is he well? To say again, esteemed oh, friend... No, all right, all remain... right. No, I understand. I am to come with you to Pugan. Campbell is there. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, to leave now is to arrive at Pugan as the sun rises. Uh, no, not good. Not today. Tomorrow morning... When the sun lives again, we will go. Uh, to say again, to leave now. No, is... no, 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 never mind that. I, I said not today. You understand? Tomorrow morning, you and I go to Pugan. Not good. Very good. Now, here, can you lead me to this address or show me how to get there? See? Mm. To answer, Mungba is able to lead to this address. I have splendid. Then meet me here at the hotel at seven this evening. No, thank you, Takin. Oh, no, no. What's all this about? To beg pardon, Takin. Though able, Mungba think not wise for one Mr. Loring 
to present himself at stated address. So, Mung Ba, not lead him there. And he smiled and bowed and scurried off. It didn't matter. I knew that somehow I would find my way to China that night. When evening came, I left the hotel and began a bewildering tour of the countless bazaars. And by asking a direction here and a question there, I came finally to a dark cluster of buildings in a remote section of the Zegyo Bazaar. And there, at the proper door, I stopped. You are the most welcome one. I'm Stephen Loring. Machina waits for you. Kindly enter. Thank you. It's a, it's a bit dark in here, isn't it? The lights of a thousand candles are soon to come, Takim. One moment. I took a few steps on past the servant, and suddenly I felt a pair of arms around me. I struggled to free myself, and then a blinding pain flashed through me, and I felt myself sinking to the floor. Faintly, I heard the voices, and only one did I recognize, that of the little Burmese, Manba. Takin. Mm-hmm. Takin. China. To wake mm. from a dream, not always pleasing, Takin. Mm. Mang Ba. Mm. What happened? Not to remember, often rewarding. Uh, yeah. well, we're, we're on a boat. Soon to land at Pugan. Mang Ba, last night you, you followed me. You saved my life. No trouble to serve friend of esteemed friend. Oh, yeah, yes. Yes, Campbell. I wonder how I'll find him. In time, Takin, all questions are answered. No. No, you're wrong. Some questions are never answered, and maybe that's just as well. Spoken like man of wisdom. Enlightenment. <laughs> Very little of either this morning, Mumba. It, it is morning, isn't it? Sun warm and you. Like Mungba has much to learn before he dies. We all do. To beg pardon, Takin, eh? some more than others. People of village are in their hearts good people, but wisdom to them new and fears old. Uh, yes, yeah, so I understand, but what is... People of village require patience. Leader who shows patience and no fear can bring my people to enlightenment, away from superstitions and ancient religious teachings. Oh, you've got the wrong idea. I have not come to lead your people any more than Campbell did. Now, understand, I've come only to get data on the ancient shrines and pagodas nearby and to help your esteemed friend Campbell. Takin to see many past glories of Pugan, but, I beg pardon, villagers of Pugan... Also there. The village, when we reached it, was somewhat inland from the river port of Pugan proper. Wood and bamboo huts lined the four sides of a square that served as a compound. A pack of wild dogs swarmed ahead of us, yapping a signal to the groups of villagers bunched together near a central hut. Mang Ba raised his hand in greeting. After a moment of frozen silence, the villagers turned and ran. They run from us. Something very wrong. Mm, not much of a welcome. Must walk ahead to hut of esteemed friend. Must smile, show no fear. Come, Takin. I fixed this smile on my face that Mang Ba ordered, and I followed him. If I showed no fear, it was not because I felt none. There wasn't a soul in sight, but my back straightened rigid with the feel of a hundred eyes upon it. Mang Ba's steps slowed at the sound of the bell, his head cocked slightly to one side as if to listen. We walked on slowly now, 
until we came to the central hut. There, Mung Ba stopped cold. No. No, not so. What? What is it? What's wrong? The evil eye, it has come. The evil eye. You are listening to Eye of Evil, tonight's presentation of Escape. Each week, CBS Radio issues an invitation to go on the prowl in a real squad car. You'll hear the stories of real witnesses in real cases as you join us on CBS Radio's Night Watch. It's unusual, thoroughly factual, and thoroughly exciting. Night Watch, every week on most of these same stations. And now, Escape and the second act of Eye of Evil. had disappeared as quickly and completely as the others, fled in terror from a crude sign I could not understand at the door of the central hut. The temple bells tolled ominously as I walked inside, not knowing what to expect. Mung Ba had called this Campbell's hut, but there was no one inside, only the strange signs and symbols affixed to everything in sight. I wanted to run too, desperately, but something told me that if I were safe at all, I was safer inside the hut. As the silent day wore on, I found many of Campbell's papers. Garbled and strange, they were a chronicle of the steady deterioration of a man. When I finally put them down, it was night. Tuck in, tuck in, Mumba falls before you. Are you hurt? Only with hurt of shame, tuck in. And get up. When duly forgiven. I said get up. And tell me what this madness is all about, these signs, this poppycock about the evil eye. Mungba, upon seeing the signs of evil eye, forgot his enlightenment. Oh, did you find out about Campbell? He is said to be possessed. And that accounts for these signs? Signs are charm to evil eye. Take away power, so say my people. Y- your people are insane. Only frightened, Takin. Look. Can't you talk to them, reason with them, tell them they have nothing to fear, that even if they did, these obscene charms of theirs are no answer? Not Mungba. Takin must do. Me? That's ridiculous. To say again, Takin must do. The evil eye is on this house. Only Takin can prove this is not so. So say my people. But, But how? Tomorrow, Takin, look upon chosen one. If chosen one not die... Spell of evil eye broken. If chosen one die, not good. Oh, of all the idiotic... To beg pardon. To do this, only way to save esteemed friend and self. There was no sleep. The Pagan night spent itself slowly, weirdly washed in moonlight and filled with strange sounds. The paddy birds, the barking deer, the cries of wild cattle, and and always, always the eerie toll of the temple bells. I could feel it building in me, a fusion of strangeness, a fear, a fear that was somehow compelling. Drawn to an opening at the back of Campbell's hut, I looked out. From there I saw a moonlight fantasy, In a clearing before an ancient pagoda, a single dancer performed. And then, somehow, I was outside the hut, walking slowly across the compound. No, Takin, no! Get out of my way. Hear me, hear, hear, Mumba. You must not answer the call of the temple bells. Stand aside. To follow is to die. I tried to free myself from Mumba's grip. I could not. And if the dancer danced on, and if the bells tolled longer, I don't know. Because suddenly the night was black and silent, and the madness was gone. You know, each night I don't know how I got to bed. 
Yet every morning, I find you here. Takin asleep well? Yeah, like I was hit on the head. Mungba, was there really a dancer out there last Mungba night? Mungba, fix tea. Takin feel fine. Was there a dancer? What has gone before belongs to the night, no longer to us. I don't understand your bloody country, Mungba, or even you. I am pleased to be a simple man. You've saved my life twice now. Why? Takin Mungba, friend. Life of friend, more precious than own life. Mungba, what happened to me last night? What happened to Campbell before I got here? Mungba, not know. Fix tea, Takin feel fine. Everything here plays on your feelings. Your emotions, the cries of the animals, the tolling of the bells, the sight of ruin after ruin, pagodas and shrines in crumbling decay. Is that it? Does the very decay here hold the power to degenerate a man? Oh, temple bell again. Hour has come, Takin. What hour? Before bright sun and my people, Takin, look upon chosen one. Only way to save esteemed friend and self. Outside, the villagers lined the compound. Some wore coverings over their entire heads. Others, with the same fear that I might possess the evil eye, hid their faces from my view. All of them, so far as I could see, wore signs and symbols as charms against my spell. Oh, it was madness. All of it. Madness. Takin, ready? Just tell me what I'm supposed to do. Chosen one will walk to center of clearing. Yeah. Temple bells will stop. That becomes signal for Takin to look for first time upon chosen one. When the bells stop. Yes, all right. Now, let's get on with it. Kindly turn back, Takin. All right. I have to make quick work of it. Tuck in. Have nothing to fear. My heart very nearly stopped with the bells. Slowly, I turned around to look upon the chosen one. He stood proudly straight, smiling confidently at me. My little Burmese friend, Mungba. And I looked and smiled and watched him fall. <laughs> Mungba! Mungba! <laughs> Mungba, how, how in heaven's name? Uh, not talking, esteemed friend. Campbell, he... Campbell? Mm. Poor, wretched devil. Mangba was dead. And I was alone. I started to lift him to carry him back to the hut, and then I saw the thin arrow in his back, a blowgun. I looked up in the direction the arrow must have come, and there it was. The ancient pagoda where the dancer had been the night before. It was also the direction of the temple bells. And this time, without anyone to stop me, I walked into the ruins of the temple. Campbell! Campbell! Where are you? I'll find you. You know, Campbell? Campbell? Over here, Loring. I can't see you. In these shadows. I'm here in the dark, and you can hear me. If your eyes fail you, follow your ears. Why did you do it, Campbell? He worshipped you. Why did you have to kill Mungba? Mungba? Cowering in the darkness won't help you, Campbell. There's a window down there. Why don't you stand proudly in the bright sunlight, as he did? Mungba died proudly. How very gallant. Oh, you are mad. Come here. Here to the light. Here now. Stand there and tell... Campbell. Are we at the window now, Loring? Campbell. You... You're blind. Do I stand proudly in the bright sunlight? 
What happened to you? Who did this to you? I shall tell if where I look, my eyes see no beauty. Oh, Campbell. We didn't understand in your letter. None of us understood. Tell me. Who did that to your eyes? Where one sees no beauty, no good, one sees evil. And once the eye becomes absorbed with evil, it is said, the eye must no longer see. Campbell, listen to me. We'll go now, you and I. I'll take you home. I am home. No, no, no. We'll go to England. Now. Together, do you understand me? You don't understand me. I want to be here. I must be here. But why? Why? This place is strange and terrifying. And, and beautiful, Loring. But you, you must go before you see its beauty, before it draws you and holds you and never lets you go. There is no beauty here. Have you not... Seen our beauty, Stephen Loring. Gina! Have you not watched the dancer by moonlight and felt compelled to follow her? Go, Loring, go now. It's not too late for you. Campbell, did Gina... Did she do this to you? Go, Loring, while you can. You were supposed to die in Mandalay, Stephen. You tried to have me killed. My people are happy as they are. Believe me, Loring, and go now. Too late is very soon upon you. I'll go. I've had my fill of this madness. Is it madness? Are you sure? You must be very sure. It might be madness. Or again, it might be a feeling a mystic something that has been known to take hold of men. I ran hard and fast from the ancient pagoda, away from China, away from Campbell. Through the compound I ran toward Pugan and the river and freedom. And when the river was in sight, my, my legs became heavy, leaden. And in my mind, I knew... I would run as far into the world as I could. But I also knew that someday I would have to come back. Under the direction of Norman MacDonnell, Escape has brought you Eye of Evil by Kathleen Height, starring John Daner. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen and Jack Crucian with Parley Bear and Ben Wright. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are adrift in a small boat somewhere in the English Channel, the fog lying heavy on the greasy moving waters, while in the dark ahead of you moving through the war-torn night towards you is a thread of death from which there may be no escape. So listen next week when Escape brings you David Devine's story, Flood on the Goodwinds. <laughs> This coming Monday night on CBS Radio's Gunsmoke, you'll discover, along with United States Marshal Matt Dillon, that the problems facing a U.S. Marshal of the Old West were just as vital and real as those facing law enforcement officers today. Remember, Monday nights on most of these same stations, CBS Radio presents realistic Western thrills on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network.